Hi, I'm Paul Simpson from the Football Club. Welcome to the Brunton Bugle. And we're looking good, you'll be in for a fight And we fight pretty good, getting goals is our job And we get goals good, looking good, we are Carlisle United Hello everyone, you're listening to the Brunton Bugle The number one place to get a kind of fix in the podcast world I'm Lee Rooney And I'm Adam Tiffin Rinse and repeat as United once again failed to follow up a good performance with another one. We look back on the excellent 3-1 win at Peter Brett on Good Friday, the Easter Monday home defeat to Lincoln, and look ahead to back-to-back away games at Northampton and Cheltenham Town. As you said in the intro there, Adam, rinse and repeat, isn't it? It's just, it's just the story of the season. One great performance, followed up by... I mean, we'll talk about it later. It probably wasn't one of our worst performances this season, but it's just not been able to keep up at the same level over two games. has been just a complete downfall, hasn't it? There's been no consistency in this season, and that's why we're, we are where we are. But it's also... Well, uh, to be fair, the one bit we have been consistent in is playing mm. well away from home against the best teams. Mm. All of the, We haven't played Derby yet, but the rest of the top five have played against all of them and played well obviously beat Bolton and Peterborough, so that's the one area of this season where you can yeah. look at and go, they've actually done pretty well in this regard, but the other, what is, is it, 35, 36 games have mm. not followed that same theme. Yeah, we should have beaten Barnsley as well, and obviously yes. could have been, could, probably could or should have beaten Portsmouth too, so mm. you're right, it, it's uh, it, it, it's quite infuriating in that sense, really, that, that, as, you, as you mentioned there, up against the clubs up at the top, we've done... Not too bad away from home at the very least. So, uh, but there you go. Um, right. Uh, yes, we're we're looking ahead. Uh, sorry, looking back on two games and looking ahead to two games in this one. So it's quite a jam-packed episode, and there's a bit of news to cover as well. Some interesting things to talk about there, isn't there? So, we'll obviously be starting with the news. We'll be looking back on the the games against Peterborough and Lincoln, and then looking ahead to Northampton and Cheltenham, including a chat with Danny from the excellent "It's All Cobblers to Me" podcast as well uh, as part of the Behind Enemy Line section. Finishing off, obviously, with X-Files as usual. It's a bumper pack one as well with that. There's plenty to talk about there, so there you go. Right, before we get underway, uh, just a reminder, this season, the podcast is sponsored once again by the Kai United Sports Club London Branch. London Branch do lots of fantastic stuff uh, for the club in terms of fundraising, but also for exiles who live in the southeast and across the whole country, actually, uh, in terms of... Uh, tickets for away games and also organising travel and designated pubs and that kind of thing. I have to say the designated pub for Peter was fantastic. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but really, really good little bar that was. Um, yeah, if you, if you want to find out, you can join them wherever you live in the country. You don't have to live in the London or South East. If you live in, you know, if you live in Carlisle, if you live in Allenby, if you live in Liverpool, if you live wherever, really. I'm not going to mention the, the thing, but we normally do that because I'm, I'm going I'm to stop people playing the bingo. Um, but yeah, if you want to find out how to join them, go to the website, carlislelandbranch.org, or grab one of the guys at one of the upcoming away games. Right, Adam, let's get into the news then. Um, a few bits have sort of come through today. Um, originally, I had nothing down here in this news, and we we're going to have a little bit of a speculation discussion about something that happened, but... The club have sort of talked about that thing now, so we, we can talk about it. But the first bit of news that emerged today, and it was something that was rumoured a couple of days ago by a reporter, for, I think, for London, was it London Live or something like that earlier in the week? News Online. That's the one, yes. So the the rumour was that Sean Green was going to be recalled early from from his loan spell, uh, could go back to Crystal Palace. And that's been confirmed by the club today, hasn't it? So after just three appearances, and I think around about 37 minutes, I think, in total, he's gone back down to Palace. Um you know, in a sense, not a huge surprise, but maybe a little bit of a surprise that this has happened. Would you say? Well, yeah, I think at, at this stage of the season, it's probably rarer to get these players being recalled because you can imagine around sort of Christmas time, yeah. if somebody's been sent on, on a year-long loan and things haven't worked out, then clubs are, are more willing mm-hmm. to take on um, to take on or take back players to send yeah. them out somewhere else to give them a better opportunity. Um, I can't remember the last time at Carlisle this happened where a a player joined in January on loan and then was recalled early. Well, the thing but... is, he, he can't play for Palace. I think he can play for Palace's under twenty ones possibly, but he can't play for any yeah. other club now. So it's a weird. Yeah, one. yeah. Um, but I, but to be fair, that's going to be better for him than playing for you know, just playing in training because yeah. that's all he's really had so far. So I, I yeah. completely understand why they've done it. Um, and from Carlisle's perspective, it's another loan signing that's not gone well. 
it's been a big, big problem this season, hasn't it, Lonies? That the standard has just not been up to it, really, compared against previous seasons, and particularly players coming back as well. You know, Finn back just that hasn't worked out anywhere near as well as we'd hoped. Um, obviously, JJ Coyote just, you know, just that's been a disaster of a signing, really, mm. in, in the grand scheme of things. Um, and yeah, there's a few of us just just haven't hit the standards we'd hoped. And I've seen a few people saying online that they hope that's the last play we get on loan from Crystal Palace, which is <laughs> it sounds terrible. But to be honest, I mean, they've been progressively get I mean, to say progressively getting worse. Green's actually looked all right, but obviously he hasn't really played, so he's clearly not been good enough to oust a struggling defence. Plange was pretty awful at times. You know, mm. occasional moments of looking like there might be a player there, and then just really lazy. And JJ, also JK Gordon last season was. In and out of the team, really, wasn't he? You know, good running, but, you know, there were spells where you couldn't really even get in the squad, so it, it's... Well, that yeah. was more down to... I think that was more down to off-the-field things and on-the-field, I, I think, yeah. rather than him not being good enough to, to play, because I think when he did play, he was good. But yeah. I, I can certainly understand why people aren't going to be happy if in the summer, you know, they see some bird-related pun in the um, in the announcements for, yeah. for a new signing. Yeah, it, it's 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 kind of it, it. Look, we all know why we go to Paris because Sean Derry's there, and also he's good mates with Greg, and that's the suggestion is that it's a lazy signing. And you know, I, I suspect these things aren't lazy signings. I'm sure Green's someone we've seen before, and potentially he's on a list of you know players we've looked at. But if we were to sign another, I think the, the alarm bells massively ring. They say, "Come on, you know, the, the, there's got to be a bit more originality in who we're signing here." Because if we're just signing players on the Open Palace, then it's ridiculous, but I, I suspect we probably won't get any more because I suspect Palace probably won't be particularly happy that he's only got what thirty-seven yeah. minutes of playing time. So, and obviously, Plange yeah. didn't get. He got a lot of playing time, Plange, but um, no. not as much near the end. But yeah, this one might be one that makes them a bit more hesitant to actually send the players, even with yeah. that existing relationship. Yeah, well, there's the squad. I mean, the, the bench is going to start to look a lot thinner, isn't it, in, in recent games? Because obviously, something we'll talk about in a second might affect the, the squad this weekend as well. Um, obviously, that means another defender's going to have to come in. Whether it's, you know, would you put Finn back on there? Probably not, because you don't really want two right backs on the bench. But Paul Huntington no. seems about a favour, so it's a, interesting to see what happens with that. Um, well, let's let's talk about it then. Um, in fact, no, actually, let's talk about the ground improvements there, I think, first. There's a couple of things that came out from the club today. Updates on the ground improvements. So they've confirmed that work has already started on the inside of the East Stand. I think they're just waiting for final sign-off in a few bits. But, yeah, it, it looks really, really encouraging, doesn't it? Some of, the, some of the work that's taken place. And they've confirmed that the back row of seats will come out of the East Stand. Also, people in Block 5 might be affected. And I know a few people who see some tickets in there. And they're a bit, they're sort of joking grumbles by it, but also acceptance that, you know, these things needed to happen at some point, so maybe not quite as bad. But, but yeah, really exciting stuff, isn't it, Adam? Yeah, definitely. And, I, yeah, like you said, I don't think those people are going to be moaning about it too much mm. when the things get done, if they're going to get done to the standard that seems to be uh, promised. But, yeah, all the stuff seems to be really encouraging. You know, they're trying to push things through as quick as they can, have things ready for the new season. Um, you know, we're going to get LED advertising boards i think i'm yeah. right in saying it's yeah, stuff like that. that that's you know not not many clubs really of our sort of standing especially in terms of the the league yeah. will have that sort of thing so it's just a it's more signs that we're stepping into the into the 21st century it is isn't it really it's it's tragic to say that but it is and and actually the stuff behind the warwick road end is probably just as important because you are finally giving them some good catering bits and actually it might encourage a few more people to go in there because I suspect a few people at the moment don't go there because like, well, the facilities are terrible. Why would you go in there? You know, can't even get a pint, proper pint, whatever. You know, now you can be able to do that, and I think that's going to yeah. actually might encourage that, might make that a bit of a busier place to go and, and hopefully get a few more fans in there. So that's really good to see. And the training ground stuff as well. Obviously, they're still waiting for the final sort of confirmation. I think June they were looking at potentially for getting a few more bits out there, but it looks like a site's been identified and they're hoping to have at least one pitch ready aren't they for the summer so i'm guessing they'll just get one pitch and probably a, some temporary porter cabins so that there's at least a quality yeah. service they can use yeah and it, it gives them that flexibility of you know they probably will at least in the short term i'd imagine stay at brunton park and the training pitch yeah. there but it get like it gives them that option because as they have often said and we all know that the water logging on that pitch is very frequent and it's very easily done so in those cases, they're not having to, you know, rely on, um, you know, going to 
to Gretna or, or to wherever they they do their training outside of uh, outside of Carlisle when they can't train on the current pitch. So yeah, it, it's it's these constant improvements that are, if anything, more encouraging about the or what gives me encouragement about the future, even though the on the pitch stuff isn't as good because it's not just we're just chucking cash at players and you know seeing what happens yeah. they're actually trying to build the club into something that's attractive and wanting to make people come to the club yeah absolutely absolutely um one of a bit actually sort of broke the other day as well actually the, the, the hand and put in the running order but it's worth mentioning is that the club adv- advertised for a new first team physio oh, yeah. and paul simpson has confirmed today that chris brunskill is leaving the club now it's a personal family decision for him essentially his, his partner's had twins i think the last year and he's got another young daughter as well so i think it's basically the toll of that he feels like he needs to be spending more time with his family which simo has said he totally respects but obviously as a result we need to get someone else in so i think they've got they've got another person coming in already to do a bit another physio role i think like an almost assistant physio uh from blackpool who's joining soon but the the first team role has been advertised as well so uh yeah it'll be a in, in, interesting one to see who comes in there we wish chris all the best obviously when he leaves at the end of the season um Right, well, we've avoided talking about it. Let's talk about this uh, this incident that uh, emerged over the weekend, Adam. Um, WhatsApp of all Kai United fans, all these Kai United fan groups was buzzing, wasn't it? With uh, some videos that were being passed around of um, a first-team player out on Saturday night um, drinking. You know, um, less than 72 hours before a game, which is part of the agreement the players have. They sign a code of conduct saying they will not drink 72 hours before a game. Out drinking... Um, and yeah, that player did play at the weekend. Um, I think, look, I, I think on the Carlisle social they didn't name the player, did they? But John Coleman sort of named the fact that the person in the video is Jordan Gibson. That that's that's the thing that's that's pretty clear from the videos. And um, we're not going to name the other players because they're not. There's no one really clearly in the videos, but names have been flying around. It's just really bitterly disappointing. This isn't it at the end of a, a season like this, and I, I, I think. One of the videos says scrapping the bounces, which is not, to be fair. That that's ridiculous hyperbole, you know, there's, there's, that's not the case. But it's just like it's just the impression it gives and you're like, come on. Where's the common sense there, isn't it? Yeah, it's we, like I said, without context, if that was just if we were playing Saturday, Saturday yeah. and then uh, the players were out on a, a Tuesday or something like that, then there's no issue because mm-hmm. They're not breaching any agreement that they've made with the club and with the manager to mm-hmm. to keep themselves to a certain standard. But it's because it's and it's not even you know if it was sort of on the border of seventy two hours, they might have just sort of been like, right, don't do that again. But we're not gonna you know we're not gonna make this into a big thing. But it's because it was pro in all likelihood on the Saturday night, obviously going into Sunday morning. Um, Depending on when the what time the players were out, I don't think that's less really than forty eight hours, is it? That, yeah, that's exactly. The thing. It's that's... not even seventy two. It's forty eight hours, less than forty eight hours, which is yeah. It, I think Lummy. I think someone made this point to Lummy on the Carl Social, and he sort of agreed. Like, have the common sense to not go out in Carlisle and do it. <laughs> go to Newcastle. Go to Manchester. Do whatever. Yeah. I mean, no one know, but barely anyone will know. Then you know to go and do it in Carlisle. You know in in. A fairly prominent bar at the top of Botchergate, you know, it's just, it, it's just the mind boggles sometimes why people do this, and then you're not helped then by the fact that when you put in a, a fairly under par performance on the Monday, and like you know, there was people joking in the paddock saying, "God, he's playing like he's been on the drink," and <laughs> people who knew who'd seen the videos who thought it was funny, and you know, it kind of feels like it's going to get, it's not not he's going to get away with it, but. Almost the fact that we're pretty much down, people aren't quite as bothered. If we were actually battling to try and stay up, people would be furious about this, I think. I think there'd be real, real anger. Oh, definitely. People are kind of accepting that it's a player who's out of contract at the end of the season who's probably, in all reality, probably going to leave in the summer. But at least show a bit of professional pride, surely. Yeah, no, I agree with you. You know, I don't think there's really much... There's not much argument in in their defence. Um I think the interesting thing now will be to what extent, well, to what extent and how quickly does punishment fall? <laughs> because, you know, they're still, like I said in the in the statement, they're still trying to, you know, check all the facts and make sure they've got everything right. 
uh, and things like that. So whether they just sort of take um, precautionary action for the upcoming yeah. games, which obviously, are, are, again, are in sh- quite a short cluster, or whether they hold off on it until they absolutely know what happened and then really throw the book at them. It'll be interesting to see what sort of decision Simo and, and the rest of the people at the club make. I'm sure it's something that the Piatics will probably be involved in to some extent as well. Yeah. I mean, look, we're not going to name names, obviously, but at least one of the players involved is under contract next season as well, which just is not great for them, I guess, in that sense. But Believed to be involved. We don't... Yes, believed to be involved, I should say. Yes, no, for sure. Being named. You're right to say that, yeah. I mean, the statement says, following Monday's game against Lincoln City, we became aware of an incident on Saturday night involving some first team players. This is subject to an ongoing disciplinary op- procedure. And then there was a comment from Simi saying, we take these issues very seriously. Uh, sorry, and this is being dealt with internally by the club. Our focus is on working professionally as we look towards another important game at the weekend and we'll make no further comment. He did add a little bit more in the interview of the club, but there was nothing that went into any detail. But I think just it's a level of frustration, I think, isn't it? Because he's been saying all season that some people just don't, aren't looking after themselves properly. And when you see this, it's kind of a, it's a real kick in the teeth, isn't it? Really, and yeah, it's it's a because you know it, it's it's all well and good, you know, Simpson saying that, yeah. but and obviously they see the behind the scenes and maybe see mm-hmm. things that players aren't doing right. But when it's more public, mm-hmm. that's when you really start to realise potentially what Simpson's been having to work almost against this season and try yeah. and overcome. If this is something that's been a consistent theme, which you know there's no evidence to say really either way whether yeah. it has or hasn't. Um, but if this has been a, if things like this, incidents like this, have been a an ongoing issue, then you know we've got to really feel for for Simpson and the even bigger task that that's presented. Yeah, proof will be in the pudding come the Northampton game of the weekend when we see the team sheet, because um, there's a chance we might see a couple of players not listed there. We might, they might well still be involved, so you, you don't know. But it's it, it's going to be interesting to see what happens there. Um, but yeah, it's pro- obviously not going to be the last we hear of this, I'm sure. But there you go. Right, um, we've covered our off, so let's let's talk about something a bit more pleasing first, because we've got two games to cover. One more pleasing than the other. Um, so let's get going. People United one, Cal United three. Where the bloody hell did that come from, Adam? You tell me. You were at the game. You were you were on the boat beforehand, oh, enjoying was... the luxuries of whatever the pub was called. It was a charters bar. Funny enough, it was called. It was just quite funny. Um, it, it, it was. Yeah, I'll tell you what, it's a lovely, but it was a really lovely little place because they've got they had this almost like a little not a fan zone, but like they had these little huts selling food and stuff in a few bars outside as well. But you could go on the boat and go below deck where there was a really long bar with loads of options and really really friendly atmosphere all the paper fans were supposed to be really spot on you know there's way fans were very much welcome in there and and yeah i tell you what i never thought of peterborough united being as a, a cracking day out but i'd 100 percent do it again <laughs> when we when we come back up and hopefully a bit you know a bit more competitive in this league but we were very competitive in this game as well to be fair um yeah i was i just perplexed it was infuriating, to be honest, by the final whistle. Like, how can we perform like that in a game like that against a team so good? And then in previous weeks, you know, barely turn up in some of the games. It's just it's just baffling, isn't it? Well, it speaks sort of to the point that I made earlier about, you know, playing well against the big teams. When you've got that mm. challenge in front of you and there's no pressure on you to win and you've got that freedom of, you know, if we lose, we lose, we're expected to lose. Mm-hmm. They, you don't have that there's probably less of that second guessing because if it goes wrong, it's expected to go wrong. And also you're playing at these yeah. big stadiums against these big teams. And it's probably the same as when you play with better players that you raise your level to it. When you play against better players, then you have to raise your level. Whereas when you're playing against players of similar level, it's then about effort and you know things like that, less relating to ability. So it's almost a bad thing that we've been so not good, but so much better against these big teams when we've played them away from home. Yeah, it's kind of like it shows that these, some of these players, there is there is talent in the squad. It's not completely abject, and you know, there's not all terrible players. It's just getting the consistency out of them. That's 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 part of the problem. Um, so I mean, for this one, team news wise, um, unchanged starting eleven. But a big tactical switch from Simmer, wasn't there? There wasn't expected for this one. <laughs> I don't think any of us thought we'd go to a back four. And John Mellish would be pushed into midfield. No. 
and I will readily admit <laughs> that I'm not a fan of seeing John Mellish in midfield. I still maintain that position across a season. I still no. would rather see yeah. him playing in defence, and by the sounds of it, so would he. Um, but I will hold my hands up. Mike can take all the plaudits for this because he is a, a stan of Mr. John Mellish and it was a brilliant switch. It probably yeah. wasn't the effectiveness that Simpson expected, but it damn sure worked. Yeah, it, it, it's, just, it's just ridiculous, wasn't it? I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about his performance in, in a minute anyway, but in, in terms of the other uh, changes... Um, George Kelly on the bench for the first time. That was nice to see. And we'll talk about his cameos a little bit later on because there was a lot of encouragement to take from that over both games. Uh, Sean Green also came onto the bench um, with Jack Robinson and Sean Maguire missing out. Um, I mean, early on, there was a, there was a couple of um, chances for Peter Bowen, long-range shots that went high and wide. And that seemed to be the, the story of the day for them, really. I mean, actually, when you look at the stats, um, Adam, They've had 23 shots, but only two on target. And when you read that, sometimes you think, oh, you know, they've had twice as many shots as we had 12 and, and 5 on target. You'd think, oh, you know, they've peppered us for ages and during the game. They didn't really. If you look back at it, to be honest, they a lot of those were shots from range that just went well wide or high. Lewis didn't have a huge amount to do in this game, did he? Well, I think this was a, a combination of them not being at it and us being very at it which yeah. led to the to the win because they had they definitely had chances to hit the target and test harry lewis but just didn't take them and would have been probably about somewhere between 10 12 minutes into the game and i put out a tweet saying god we could ship a few here which obviously then at full time a lot of people were saying god this has aged well i've never been more happy to be wrong and i with, with these points of carlo if i'm being negative i i don't want to be right Nobody wants to be right when no. you're being negative about your club. You'd rather be wrong and gain points. So I was very happy that I was completely wrong about that because I really did fear at the start of the game that Peterborough were going to put in probably a 3-1 result the other way around, if not more. Yeah, I mean, Jack Ellis getting the early booking on Mason Clark as well. That, that was that, stupid. It, it, it was stupid. It was very soft. I mean, there was a couple of soft bookings given to us in that. In but it was a stupid decision to give yeah. him the yellow card. I don't think it was a stupid challenge from memory. I don't think yeah, it was yeah. uh, I don't, anything I, too malicious. I don't think he needed to give it, but it, it's one of those ones, I guess. But but yeah, and that that worried me at that point. But actually, fair play to Jackie. Actually, actually had a pretty good game. We'll yeah, talk about him. His, his overall performances recently in after after we talk about the Lincoln game. Um, but yeah, early chance for Peter, but and then. There was a slight pen shot for us from Mellish. I've looked back at it, there's no chances to penalty in, in a million years. That clearly wins it and puts it out for a corner. But from the resulting corner, the first goal, and it was nice to see a, a sort of a well worked set piece from us, wasn't it? Lovely little move. It's a rarity, but they come round. They come yeah. round every so often. Um, not as often as we'd have liked this year, but yeah, it's obviously it's something Simpson mentioned after the game they've been working on. You know, if mm-hmm. there's the opportunity to go short because. As more and more teams are doing nowadays, instead of going man for man with those short corners, they're just sending one player to defend it. Yeah. And when you give Gibson space to put in a ball like that, he can deliver. And yeah. it's a great header by Mellish, and it's a great find by by Gibson. Yeah, it, you've got to say, lovely little bit of footwork from Gibson to get it onto his left foot. And that's the thing with Gibson. When he doesn't have too much time to think about it, he can put a decent cross in with his left foot as well. Puts it right on a plate for Big John. He loses his market and bang, 1-0. And at that point, you're like, wow, you know, this, all right, we've got something to hold on to here, you know. There wasn't yeah, any pot. Zach's thought. There wasn't was any like, pot. We're just going to get, if we've got something to cling on to for as long as possible, just take us to 80 minutes at 1-0, one 1-1, nil, one one and I'll be happy. Yeah. yeah. I think they had one more chance in the first half period where Poku had a shot that went wide from across to the far post and... That was about it, really. We we didn't really threaten a huge amount, but we defended really well. We defended the team, and that's what, what you wanted. Start of the second half, we came out absolutely flying. I mean, it, it was just bizarre. I don't know where it came from, but I've got to say, second goal was all Big John, though, wasn't it? Um, initially wins the ball. Uh, it comes then to someone, and he, he picks it up on the, uh, on the right and goes on a great little mazy run. Cuts inside, hits a shot that's blocked, and then the clearance from Edwards, pretty poor, to be honest, but... Some great bit of um, 
what's what's the phrase I'm trying to think of? Like just um, you know, quick thinking from Big John, wasn't it? And thinking I'm just going to hit this on the left foot volley first time, smashes it past the keeper, and bang, it's two nil, and he's doing the Barini, and you're like, are we watching the same team we've seen all season here? <laughs> well, the the funny thing about it was, and this sums up John Mellish so perfectly. Yeah. I don't know if you remember in the first half he tried a similar sort of volley. I think the one in the first half was maybe more of a, a scissor kick, so a bit harder for technique, and he might have hit it on his right foot. But I'm pretty sure it went out for a throw-in. And then in the second half, he tries something very similar yeah. and finds the back of the net with it. Um, yeah, I think for pretty much all these goals, you can fault Peter but to some extent. But again, it's another it's a moment of brilliance from someone who, when he does produce them, there's nobody you'd rather produce them than him. Yeah. Yeah, he's just got the. He just. I, th- I think the thing with Big John is he, he thinks on instinct, doesn't he? He plays on instinct quite a lot of the time. He just thinks, yeah. I'm just going to do this. There's no. Doesn't put too much thought into it. And that, that really works so well. He literally just thought, you know, I'm just going to hit this as hard as I can. And actually, because it's straight out the keeper, but actually, it's so powerful. He's passed him by the time he has a chance to even move. Brilliant bit of technique. Um, we all went barmy in the away end. And then <sighs> there was. Very nearly a golf Gibson in a lovely uh, counter-attacking move. His shot was deflected just wide of the post. From the resulting corner, cleared back out on the gear. He puts the ball back into the box. It's a bit of head tennis. Lavelle nods it down. And it, it's almost Zidane-esque in the uh, Champions League final, isn't it? And his technique and the way he hits it. Big John, not quite the same angle. But brilliant first-time left foot volley. Bang, back of the net, 3-0. And... and I was actually genuinely stood in the in the stand, open mouth at this point. Like, am I just am I imagining this? Uh, has Big John gone into midfield, scored a hat trick, and we're three 0 up at like arguably the one of the best teams we've played this season? Yeah, it was it was a confusing state. I was watching from home on iFollow. I was on my knees with shock. I could not yeah. believe that not only were we three 0 up against, like I say, one of the best teams in the league. Um, but the fact that John Mellish had scored all three goals. Yeah. Um, and the funny thing I saw after the game, I don't know if it was a Derby fan or a Portsmouth fan or something like that who had seen the result and realised that it was obviously wasn't playing at centre-back at the time, but that a centre-back had scored a hat-trick yeah. and has massively dented Peterborough's uh, promotion hopes, which yeah. was, I mean, just the whole thing, it's, just, it's hilarious. It's just, because it, you, can't, you can't justify it. No. There's, there's not there's nothing that suggests that this should happen, but it has. Yeah, and like, it's it's the technique of hitting it because it's coming down and it's it's, it's always over it's, his shoulder. It's, it's, it's a striker's finish, a, yeah. and a good striker's finish at that. Yeah. I think I think he's caught out the keeper. I don't because I think it's quite close to the keeper, but he's hit it so well, the keeper again just doesn't have a time to react for it. And from the angle where we were sat in the stand, I thought at first he put it wide and it hit the advertising hoarding behind the goal and come back out, but everyone was going nuts, and I was just like, what? But that, 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 has that just happened? It, it was just bizarre. It's, but yeah. Uh, yeah, again, it's it's not great, if I remember correctly. I'm pretty sure Peterborough had at least one chance to clear it. Mm. But like you say, it falls to him. And with the previous goal as well, instinct, just try and put your foot through it. But there was there was actual the technique. Well, there was technique to the other one too, but the other one you could just sort of try and leather it a bit more and yeah. there's more chance of it going in. This one was a very, very good finish. Um, and one that deserved a 3-0 lead. You know, if that yeah. had been 1-0 and we'd have lost, we'd have gone, oh, for God's sake, you know, we've just yeah. we've got this brilliant goal and it's just yeah. been, it's it's for nothing. Yeah. But thank God it means something because it was brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Peter, we got a goal back not long after. Um I think Burroughs' initial shot from the edge of the box is actually going wide if you watch it back. Randall sticks a foot out and just directs it just inside the post um, past Lewis, who didn't have any chance with it. Um, there's a few more chances for Peter, but Clark Harris came on and caused some problems. He headed one wide when he should have done a lot better. He probably should have scored, really, with that one. Yeah, he the should one, have scored that header. The one where he flicked it over his shoulder it was a uh, almost a genius goal, to be fair, and he was unlucky that, with that yeah. one to hit the bar. Barkley had a brilliant clearance off the line as well, really, to, to, to deny them. But there was also another chance where Gibson broke away down the, the left after a good bit of play by Harrison Neal. Gets into the box, does the little chop turn that he did against Bolton, but he didn't quite have as much space this time. The keeper comes out. 
I don't think it's a penalty. I think having looked back at Neither. it, he, he, his, his knee might connect slightly with Gibson's foot. It's hard to tell on, on the footage, but for me, nowhere near enough contact for a bit to be a penalty. And then Armstrong was just crowded out too quickly and, and, and the block came in and uh, it was cleared. Um, and that was pretty much it for, for the game. Um 3-1, we, we, we saw the game out. I, there was no point in the last five or ten minutes where I thought, oh, I'm a bit worried. I was kind of like, we're actually quite comfortable, but we're, we're, we're keeping them arm's length. And yeah, Clark Harris is always going to be a big threat. You know, you expect that. But actually, overall, we, we, we played pretty well, didn't we? So three points. And yeah, delaying relegation for a little bit longer, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. we Once it got to sort of 90 minutes or around 90 minutes, when I was like, right, I think we've we've shown enough in this game that we're switched on enough defensively that we're probably going to see this out. That's when, but that sort of... I can't remember exactly when the the Peterborough goal went in, mm-hmm. but sort of like late seventieth, early eightieth minute, I was like, God, if they get a goal here, then we could really come unstuck, especially mm. with what happened in the previous game against Stevenage. So I was nervous for a bit, but like uh, I said, I've... once it got to sort of that extra time period, I was like, okay, we should be fine. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, obviously, we talked about John's goals brilliant finishes but actually you've got to give him some credit as well because he moved back to centre back after they made it 3-1 and played pretty much the last 25 minutes there and again was excellent just booting the ball clear doing his job and just shows how adaptable he is as a player really really good I'm so pleased for him that he got the hat trick uh, Jordan Gibson came off the bench in this one early on for Taylor Charters and he, he made an impact didn't he you know he, 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 I think in these big away games he, he can turn up and he can be, particularly on the counter attack he's so good uh, getting you up the pitch, isn't he, and, and bringing the ball forward. I think he's a really big player for that, and it's kind of infuriating that we didn't really get more out of him this season, really. But again, it's that raising your level when you know you have to because you're up against better players. But he he's someone in the squad who has the quality, if he does raise his level, to be you know one of the better players on the pitch. So for him, it's, I think it's probably been in every... Well, I don't think he really played much at all against Barnsley. I don't. I didn't watch Portsmouth, so I can't really remember. But Bolton, obviously, got the hat trick. Yeah. Um, a penalty, uh, basically open goal and a deflection. But he still yeah. played well in the game. And obviously, this game too, we he came off the bench and his uh, effort was better. It wasn't mm. brilliant. I think Butterworth probably in this game outshone him in terms of defensive effort because we needed a lot of it from from -hmm. those areas Um, and Butterworth uh, put in a a bit of a better shift than than Gibson did but yeah it's it's good that he can come off the bench and have these impacts but the frustrating thing like you said is you want more you want it to be more consistent yeah absolutely right uh, we we won't talk about Georgie Kelly because we'll talk about him uh, when we talk about the Lincoln game because I think we can talk a bit about both performances for him um quick rundown of the league one results from good friday uh barnsley two nil home defeat against cambridge that was a bit of a shocker that one blackpool uh, sorry derby kept their promotion hopes uh, going with a one nil home win over blackpool Exeter and charlton played a one one draw that doesn't really mean anything for either side to be honest uh fleetwood blew it against Cheltenham, didn't they they got it back to one one but ended up losing 2-1 in this game. And oh, yeah. It's looking like Fleetwood are pretty much coming down with us, doesn't it, really, at the moment? You mm-hmm. wouldn't be surprised. Lincoln got a 1-0 win against Leighton Orient to keep their playoff hopes uh, alive at that point. Port Vale, they've suddenly started to find a few results, haven't they? 2-0 win against Bristol Rovers to give them hope of potentially staying up this season. Reading got a 1-0 win over Northampton. They're pretty much safe now. I think Shrewsbury's similar. 1-1 draw against Oxford is put them in a, a better position at least anyway Stephen and Sh- played out a 0-0 draw with Bolton Wigan drew 1-1 with Burton who were you know, fighting to keep themselves above water and uh, finally Wickham lost 3-1 at home against Portsmouth who look pretty much destined to finish uh, as champions now right well let's look back on the uh, Easter Monday game then uh, a reverse in terms of scoreline this time United were 3-1 uh, losers against Lincoln City um, yeah just just it, it's a weird one this game, I think, because I, I don't. It's it's nowhere near our worst performance of the season, nowhere near it. And yet, you know, stats wise, you look at it, nineteen shots in total, seven on target. That's a pretty decent return. You know, Lincoln only had eleven and, and five. Possession wise, 
fifty-five percent to their forty-five. Pass success was seventy-five percent. You know, it's it, they're all good stats, and you're know, ten corners, but you still came away from it thinking, yeah, it's probably a fair result, didn't you? Yeah, I think it's the moments that don't necessarily get tracked by stats, like mm-hmm. the amount of times there's miscommunication, players going mm-hmm. for the same ball, two players not going for the ball because they think the other one's going to go for it, um, and that. Gen- and that general quality that we don't possess, which really showed because yeah. all three of their goals came from, you know, you can argue and you can definitely argue for the first two that, and even the third one, to be fair, that we could have done better defensively. Yeah. yeah. But they're all a good bit of play by the Lincoln players. So we don't have that. We don't have players who can consistently pop up with moments of brilliance to not only create for themselves, but for others too. Lincoln do, and that was the deciding factor. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, team news wise, out of this one, uh, there was obviously two changes from the Peterborough game with the injuries to Charters and McGeek, which um, meant Gibson Robinson came in with Maguire returning to the bench. Um, yeah, I mean, goals are major instance. I mean, we did have an early chance, didn't we? You know, early on with. Um, well, Mellish obviously playing in midfield again in this one. He, he broke away down the left and actually put quite a good ball into the edge of the box that. I think both Armstrong and Butterworth couldn't quite get to, and then eventually it did come to Butterworth, and he hit a low shot that was pushed around the post. But then, 10 minutes into the game, and, like you say, it's a defensive mistake that leads to the start of this move. And Jack Ellis, that's a simple ball to play to Harrison Neal, and he, and he messes up the pass. He puts it too far ahead of him. It, there's still a little bit of play that comes after that, but it, it just put them back onto the front foot. They get out of wide to Sorensen. He, he was actually, I thought, was excellent. Probably one of the best right backs I've seen this season. Um, he put the ball to the far post that Taylor nods back down, and and House has got a an easy tap in at the far post, hasn't he? And it's it's it just really infuriating how how easy it was for them. Yeah, and with a team on form like they are, you don't want to give them an opening. No, because no. you know they weren't. Like I said, we started the game as we have done a lot of times this season pretty well, but then we've given opposition teams a chance to to go ahead and take take the initiative and they've done that more often than not and then that's put us so far behind because we don't have the quality then to overcome how they set up and the quality that they have uh with their players this game reminded me a lot of when we played derby at home well, I think we actually played quite well against Derby at yeah. home and they weren't necessarily I think Lincoln were probably better than Derby were yeah. But it was just moments of poor decision making, defending that gave them easier goals than they should have had, which put it out of sight for us. I think that's a really good comparison. Actually, I think you're absolutely right. That that derby game is a really good one to throw back to because, like I said, we actually played fairly well in that game and ended up getting nothing from it. Which, like you said, story of our season at times. Really, you know, in the occasions when we have played well, we just haven't done enough to actually get over the line in those matches. Um, there wasn't a huge amount else that happened really in the um, in, in in the in the first half in terms of chances. I mean, Mellish had one from the edge of the box that was deflected wide, and I think um, Taylor had an effort from distance that was comfortably held by uh, Lewis. Start of the second half, we came out flying, didn't we? And you thought, wow, they've had a bit of a rollick in here. They, they, they've actually come out and they seem to have a point to prove. And you know, early on. Um, there's a chance for Mellish, isn't there? From a, a nice little dink ball into the box from Gibson, and he heads it, and the keeper—it's a powerful header, and the keeper does well to t- tip it over. At the time, I thought he's done really well actually to get a decent effort on goal there. When I've watched it back from the angle, because I was in the paddock, I was when, when I saw it. When I've seen it from the east stand, from the camera angle, oh, could he do a bit better there, John? Maybe. I see. I haven't. I haven't looked at it back because I, I was in the paddock but I think you're more mm. towards are you more, you're more towards sort of the well, waterworks aren't you I, I, I'm, I'm more actually, down towards the Warwick I was actually towards Warwick because I, I was coming back from being out at the fan zone so I, I saw it as I was coming back in right um, and yeah my my first thought was it was a really good effort and a good save but actually when you look back at it he's completely unmarked and actually he probably gets too much on it he probably just needs to glance it and, and almost put it down low and actually put it in a height where the keeper could make a save but the keeper actually for them right making his, I think I think he's making his debut it was his first appearance for a while for them at least had a really good game to be fair um, yeah. and you know it t- palms it over the bar and you think okay you know that's given us a lift you know potentially we could we could get something for this and then oh, 
Butterworth's chance. That was the big one, wasn't it? Yeah, but I, 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 he hits the post. It's not a horrendous finish. I don't. Also, it's not like a horrendous he's... finish or miss. I'm just saying, if that goes in, the game yeah, changes because no, the crowd's really lifted at that point, isn't it? And he, he's so unlucky. It's it's a good flick on by Armstrong mm-hmm. into his path. That's all you were going to say there. <laughs> no, no, it's all right. I thought you were continuing with your description. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Butterworth, it's... I wouldn't even say that's like the inconsistency with him because I don't think that's inconsistency. I no. think that's just, you know, fine margins. If that goes slightly, mm-hmm. you know, to the left, then it goes in. But also that maybe gives the keeper more of a chance um, mm-hmm. of getting a hand on it. Yeah, it, it's, it's those moments that haven't quite broken for us this season. And that's just another one. But I wouldn't say it's like when um, when Diamond went through against uh, Stevenage and should be scoring and yeah. just didn't put in a good enough effort. No, no, absolutely. I think he makes a good, uh, makes good effort at it, puts it in a decent area. It's just, that's your luck sometimes. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, a, it's actually a tough chance. And to be fair, he's done really well to get a good quick shot off there. Because if you look, he takes one touch and then just hits it. There's no, there's no, the decision making's really, it's something we've complained about with him. The decision making there was quick and, and, and good. You know, it was like, right, I'm going to get a touch away here and I'm just going to hit it try and catch the keeper out. He does catch the keeper out, but he's unlucky, he hits the post. But that's, like you said, the fine margin. And then, like, not long after, we get a corner. Um, and the ball comes to the box, and there's a bit of a scramble. Lavelle nearly gets on it. The ball's cleared out. Butterworth sort of goes to head it, and it sort of comes out to to Ellis. <sighs> and he boots the ball against Butterworth. They sort of end up with a bit of a heap. Lincoln break quickly. House plays in Taylor, and, you know, he's in a real hot streak of form for them and what he did really well with this actually turn I thought is he used um, Armour as a shield I don't think Armour does a huge amount wrong could maybe get a little bit tighter but I think he's just trying not to get caught out with him going past him and as it is he used Armour as that shield curls the ball into the far corner and it's, it's a great finish and Lewis doesn't really have much chance of stopping it does he? As soon as Joe Taylor went through because he is he's a quality player he's yeah. very good and people he was obviously on loan at, at Colchester for mm-hmm. the first half of the season and was pretty much single-handedly scoring goals for them. He was the one that scored, if people remember uh, and aren't aware. the When Luton played in the, in the playoff final, they scored, I think, the second half or the first yeah. half of extra time. A goal that was ruled out, he came off the bench for them and scored that goal. Oh, wow. So <laughs> he's a he's a lethal finisher. He's and he's, But he's not the, t- the type of player you'd expect to be a lethal finisher by looking at him, he looks more like mm. a, a winger who's maybe going to go past people and create chances for others. Yeah. But he's so good in front of goal. As soon as I saw the ball go into him, I thought, it's 2-0. I wasn't at all thinking Lewis could save this or I might get back on yeah. this, is 2-0. Yeah, you just had this sinking feeling of like, oh, he's, he's that good here. And I was, I, part of me was thinking in the head, like, to arm, say, show him down to his left foot, show him his left foot. But I kind of felt like if he did that, he'd probably end up having to try and tackle him and, and give away a penalty. So... Uh, you know, from that distance to finish like that, you just got to take your half, really, don't you? In the end, it's, it's the it's the build up that's the problem. You know, the, the, the yeah. mistake from from Ellis there. Um, United very nearly got straight back into it, though, didn't they? They had a chance, and tell you what, if Dan Butterworth scores this, it's goal of the season sorted for me. Technique wise, it was superb. It was a a free kick was cleared back out to him. He just sets it up with his with his right foot. It sits really nicely, and he smashes a a, a volley. That fair play, the keeper does brilliantly to tip over the bar, doesn't he? Yeah, so it's a a great strike, and that's the that's the ability that he possesses, yeah. and sort of like Gibson, you just wish sometimes you saw it a bit more. Yeah. But those moments of magic are why why he's been starting recently, um, and as we'll probably get onto, why some people weren't too happy that he was brought off. No, absolutely. So uh, not about ten minutes to go. Sam Lavelle gets. Uh, one back for us. Um, ball from the left by Robinson, nodded back down by Maguire and, and Lavelle. It, it, it looks a better finish on the cameras from the East Stand than I think it actually was in reality when you look back at it. Because from our angle in the paddock, I'm sure you probably agree, Adam, it was quite a scuffed effort. It almost spun up in the air, didn't it? It was a, it was a weird one, really. Caught the keeper out a bit. It wasn't a... I don't think he necessarily intended it to go exactly no, no, like that when he, when he tried to hit it. But... Um... I mean, he could have had two or three in this game with the amount of chances mm. that fall to him. And they were speaking on the the Carlo social about um, some players just have a sort of knack 
of the ball mm. falling to them in the box. And unfortunately, he has that knack um, because it creates more frustration. I'd almost rather he wasn't in those positions sometimes yeah. to then mess up the chances where you think, oh, God, we, if only it was somebody else. Yeah. If only you it was can, somebody else. You kind of want, really, with the chances he's had this season, he probably should have seven or eight goals, really, to be honest. Oh, yeah, definitely. Four that he's got. Because he gets it, he, like I said, he gets in good positions and he's big and physical. And hopefully next season in League Two, he can he can start being that kind of player. He'll get those sort of numbers for us. Um, there was then a chance for Lincoln, who didn't sit back at that point. They they thought we need to get a third just to wrap things up. Sorensen free kick from the right was flicked onto the post by uh, Paul D O'Connor, and then um, Teddy Bishop gets the, the the final goal in injury time after. Emmanuel had brought um, a player down on the attack and curls the free kick into the top corner. I say top corner. Someone watching on iPhone messaged me and said to me, do you not think he could have done better there? Do you think he maybe could have got a hand to it? From the live action, when I saw it, I was standing down at the far end of the paddock um, as, the, as the free kick was uh, taken. I, I kind of feel like it was just a really well hit free kick and there's not much you could have done more about it, but I don't know what you thought about it. No, I agree. I, from my angle, I thought, yeah, that's just a good free kick. It wasn't like... Maybe if he doesn't make the effort to try and get there and he just sort of stands and watches it yeah. go in, hoping it's going to hit the bar or something, you can say, oh, he should have made an effort. But he does try to get across to it. Yeah. But like you say, I agree with you. I think he's just... He's hit it very well and it's a, mm. a free kick that you you can accept conceding because it is, it's it's yeah. of that level. I mean, uh, oh, for a player who could strike a free kick like that this season, that would have uh, made a big difference, I think it's fair to say. Um, well, yeah, that was pretty much it. No other chances after that. That was game over. Um, and like I said, not not the worst performance of the season, but just it just to have one that was a little bit more below par, not being able to keep up to that level of the, the Peterborough game is just the, is the real frustration in all this, isn't it, really? that That's what we really wanted uh, from this game. Um... Yeah, like I said, we, we create a chance. It depends on the mix-up of costers in this. Communication, it's a big issue, isn't it? I think, I think we're all in agreement. That, that's something that was has been a big problem this season. I think it also comes from just lack of confidence in yourself. You sort of, you start second-guessing your decisions. You, yeah. you go and then you see somebody else and you, if you're, if you're full flow, confidence, playing well, you know, pretty much every week, there's no hesitation, but when that hesitation comes is when those start uh, sorts of things start to happen, and I think that's a big reason why it was happening so much. But you you know you look at you know two days earlier they'd just gone to you know one of the best teams in the league and played so well there shouldn't have been that that lack of confidence that lack of belief and quick decision making. So yeah. it was it was just so frustrating because it was from the start and it was right through to the end pretty much um it just it was so consistent it wasn't like you know you can look at if it was just the ellis and butterworth situation on its own you can just go oh, well, that's, it's frustrating but it's not a theme yeah. the problem was it it was consistent yeah on the point of jack ellis um i really like the lad i think there's a, a really good player in there and i think he's going to turn out to be a player play for us for quite a few years and, and do a good job but at the moment, do you wonder if it's maybe worth taking him out the firing line? Because take away that Peterborough game, I think he struggled a bit in a few of these games recently. And I think, particularly, this has been pointed out to me by someone else who watches us. So, like, just watch him. His forward passing's not great. He, he does lose possession a lot. And look, we joked on the last episode about the fact that you'd mentioned the fact that none of our right backs had set up a goal this season. And what does yeah. Jack Ellis do in the next game? Goes and sets one up. But. I just wonder. I, I get why Simpson's doing this. I get. I'm, I'm. I'm guessing his thought process here is Jack's on the contract for next season. He's part of my squad. I want to have him ready and get him up to speed and make sure he's ready for next season. But at the same time, are you potentially denting his confidence? It, like I said, it's a tough one because it might not be conscious, but there seems to be a plan of playing players who are going to be here next season. Um, because that's what we need to look towards and sort of after the game against Lincoln was the first time I think that uh, Simpson said yeah we're, we're going to get relegated so we need to look towards next season obviously it could have happened on um, mm -hmm. 
on Monday had things gone a, a different way in other results. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd, I didn't think Emmanuel did too bad. I mean, that I don't remember that cross he had on the left hand side when he won the ball back, did yeah. his trademark step overs, and as soon as he'd done those step overs, I think this is going into the Warwick. And it just goes he a, straight off his foot. He was a bit off angle. balance, wasn't he? To be fair, as he did. Yeah, that, but that's that's, that's the sort of player he is. He's almost he's almost got too much power for his own good. Mm. Where he's, he's too almost like Mellish sometimes, where he's too sort of amped up and yeah. all all things firing for him to be able to control it. Um, yeah, I think with Ellis it's tough because I don't you know wing back's not his natural position. Either. No. I know when he was in the uh, I'm pretty sure when he was in the academy he was played as a centre back. I don't centre back. Yeah. Big enough to be a centre back, really at this level. So he might have to stay in this position, but it is a tough one because you look and you think, what other options really are there? And also, like I say, Simpson probably got that attitude of we're just gonna, you know, keep him playing, and he's gonna be here next season, and he might be someone we rely on a lot. Yeah. So we want to make sure he's, you know, up to speed of things. Yeah, absolutely. I, th- I think for the youth team, yeah, you're right, he you played centre-back. I think he played a bit in sort of defensive midfield as well, so I do wonder if that's a potential option in the future, maybe for sort of role he could play. He's, quite a, he's a pretty good tackler, you know, he, he does win the ball back quite well, so One thing maybe. I would say is, I think he's got more confident on the ball over the yeah, last few weeks, because yeah, that, yeah. Was a, that was a real a real sticking point of him, was the fact that maybe he had more defensive cover than somebody like mm-hmm. Emmanuel or, or Finn back, but going forward he just wasn't he wasn't quite yeah he didn't have that confidence to you know try and go past people but I think that's got a lot better now that he's had this run of games and he's got that cohesiveness with the players around him yeah absolutely so I I, I think they will stick with him and look I, I, I hope I hope we sort of got some of the, the, the tougher games out of the way at the moment and we've got a few more to come but you know, hope, hopefully he can sort of shine in these final few games because obviously it looks like Finn Back's not probably going to feature again this season, I don't think, which is a, sh- a real shame that that one hasn't worked out as we'd, we'd hoped it would do this season. And, and to be honest, I'm not 100% convinced by Emmanuel from what I've seen of him, whether he's one worth sticking with, if I'm, if I'm honest. Um, Dan Butterworth. I've got to say, you know, I, I've been critical of him this season. Starting to slightly win me over. I still think that decision-making element of his game needs to improve. But you can really start to see some of the quality in his game, can't you? And you're actually looking, in recent weeks, he looks a good finisher. When he does it on instinct, he really does look like a good finisher, doesn't he? You know, he can he can strike a ball so well. And the hard work starts to come there as well. And I think it was Mike mentioned this to me. He, he, he kind of feels like he could be a player who could really actually do quite well in, in League 2 next season, potentially, for us. I, I, yeah, I'm I'm inclined to agree with you because of what we've seen over recent weeks. It's that consistency in putting all those components mm. together that's going to be the issue. And we sort of knew from what uh, Port Vale fans and others had said that that was the issue with him was, you know, sometimes he's going to be brilliant and eye-catching and then other weeks he's going to struggle to get involved. But since he's had that run of starts, which is, it's something that, you know, I think I think uh, Chris Lumsden's mentioned this a lot, where it's a bit easier to come off the bench because you know you can sort of assess the flow of the game and where you can maybe make an impact, and it's harder to be as good from the start. And he wanted to see some of the people who were on the bench start these games and and perform well, and I think Butterworth has done that. Um, yeah, and I, I won over probably isn't the right phrase for me. No. Yeah, I'm. I'm warming up is probably the better uh, phrase for me in terms of how I feel towards him because I can I can see how he'd be effective in in League Two. It's yeah. just whether I'd actually want him to be starting this much or whether I'd yeah. rather have somebody else in that position. I'm not sure. I kind of feel like he's a player who would, who would do better in a team that's doing well as well. I kind of feel like if we're a team that's pushing up towards the top of League Two. He's a player who could excel at that level. I think in a team that's struggling, he's always going to be a bit hit and miss. So we'll, we'll have to see. His substitution, as we mentioned earlier, um, drew some boost from the crowd, didn't it? Because I think it literally happened uh, like a few minutes after he had that volley that we mentioned that he nearly scored from. And obviously he'd hit the post at the start of the, uh, the half as well and had a you know an effort in the 30. Could have had a hat-trick, arguably, you know, with the chances he'd had. Um, 
Simo did explain after the game, though, didn't he? He said that he wanted to keep Gibson and uh, Robinson on because he felt that those two were more likely to get good balls into the box, having brought Georgie Kelly on and having two big strikers up there. I actually do get what Simpson's saying there, to be fair. And I did say this at the time, so I, I get what he's doing there. I just don't think Butterworth would have been able to do it at 4-4-2 as a winger. I think you needed to have him buzzing around as that sort of central player. And obviously, if you take, you're bringing on Kelly, you're not going to take Armstrong off, are you, really, as a, as a goal threat? So... Um, I get what he's saying, but I'm sure Simpson was probably aware of the fact that it wasn't going to be a popular decision to take him off, wasn't he? Yeah, I, I definitely agree with where you're coming from. The only the point I would raise to counter it would be yeah. if you know he was playing well, so was it necessary mm-hmm. to change the system? Right, I know you want to get Kelly on because he was encouraging in the time he was given at Peterborough, and obviously was, as we'll get on to in this game too. But uh, what, it was around sort of probably 60 minutes or so, uh, if I'm right in saying. I can't remember exactly when it was, but there's still a decent amount of time left in the game. It wasn't... I think if you're going to go to that sort of style of play where you're going to get crossed in the box, I agree. But Worth is probably yeah. not the best one to do that. But at that time, he was you know, he was creating chances. He just had mm. that volley. He was looking threatening. So I just don't think it was necessarily perfect timing. But I do understand why he made the choice. Yeah, 58 minutes it was. The sub was made. But the, the problem for Simo there is he's, he's damned if you do, damned if you don't, because people have complained that he takes too long to make subs this season. So he's been a bit more decisive. It's just the sub he's made. Yeah, I I, I, I do get why people questioned it, because like you said, he, he was the player who looked the most threatening for us. But I can also get why you want to have two big physical lads up there and players lumping the ball yeah. into the box with them. So, and you know, so, it's yeah. all well and good us saying this in hindsight, which sort of undermines the whole you know, point of this podcast, but keep listening. Um, <laughs> you know, it's it's so hard at the time to make those decisions. And, you know, if it goes the right way, we say, you know, what a brilliant move that was. And if it doesn't, uh, then we remember the booze. But unfortunately, that was the case. And, yeah, it's just, like I say, damned if he does, damned if he doesn't. Um and that's been the case for a lot of this season. I do think substitutions is something you can fairly criticise Simpson for. But, yeah, like I said, I think this is one where you can, at least from my point of view, I can understand both sides of the argument. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, let, let's sort of end this on a positive then. Let's talk about uh, someone who did, did, did shine over these two games. Uh, Georgie Kelly finally got to see him in action. And we can see why the Rotherham fans were so disappointed at losing because there's a little bit of the... Joe Garner and Lee Miller about him, isn't the way he plays? You know, big, not not the biggest physical. He's not like as big as Armstrong in terms of height, but big, strong lad puts himself about. Isn't afraid to to play a bit in a brash way, really, almost. And you know, nearly scored an out, you know outrageous chip against Peterborough as well. He saw the keeper off his line, sent it over the bar. If we can keep him fit, I feel like him and Armstrong could be a real, real handful next season. Well, I was surprised how much of a physical presence he was just because from mm. the very very brief clips i saw from his time at rotherham yeah he seems more like of a sort of wiry poacher so i thought you know mm. is this going to work having the both of them you know kelly and armstrong playing at the same time you know i, I thought they'd maybe be a bit too similar where they're not overly physical but also not overly mm. uh physically gifted in terms of pace and things like that athletic is the word I'm looking for. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's he seems like he's he's about that life of, you know, getting stuck in, winning headers, trying to create those opportunities for other people. Um, and I think it's one, like you said, if we can keep him fit, it's going to bode really well in the future because that style suits League 2 perfectly. Yeah. And, and you know what? I think he actually brings a bit more out of Armstrong as well. Takes a little bit of the pressure off Armstrong, doesn't he, in terms of him, you know, having to you know, do a lot of the donkey work. Because, I mean, poor Luke, he's had to do so much work over the last two or three months, hasn't he? You know, he's barely had a a break in terms of, you know, coming off or anything like that. So actually Mm. having someone on there to take away a bit of that physicality really helps him. And I think actually you'll you'll see a benefit from him in terms of, you know, the chances that Kelly will probably create for him too. So, yeah, yeah, I I think that's a massive positive, you know, going forward. And and, and hopefully, you know, we'll we'll see some some real quality from, from those two. Next season, which I say, whichever division we're in, we know which division we're going to be in, don't we? So let's, yeah, let's we... not be too optimistic here. But there yeah. you go. Right, uh, quick roundup of the uh, League One results from Easter Monday. Then um, 
Nil nil draw between Blackpool and uh, Wickham. Uh, Bolton got a five two win over Reading to keep their automatic hopes uh, alive. Nil uh, nil draw between P- Bristol Rovers and Shrewsbury. Burton lost three one at home against Barnsley. At one point they were winning one nil and we were going down, but obviously Barnsley came yeah. back in that one. So we live to fight another day. Um, then Cambridge got a three one win over Wigan. A big result for them. You know, to drag them sort of away from the. From the trouble, uh, obviously we lost three one at home against Lincoln. Charlton got a nil nil draw against Stephen. There's quite a few nil nils about on this day, wasn't there? Uh, Cheltenham lost two one at home against Exeter. A bit of a blow for them, you know, with the form they've been in recently. Uh, Leighton Orient lost two one at home against Peterborough. Who bounced back in uh, the best way possible after losing against us. Uh, Northampton beat Port Vale two nil to sort of drag them back into trouble. And Oxford United got a four nil win over Fleet, but who do look as doomed as we do now? I think it's fair to say. Yeah. And then on to Tuesday night, there was a 2-2 draw between uh, Portsmouth and Derby, which we'll talk about in the X-Files section later. Yeah. Give you a little uh, look ahead. So, yeah. Just onto the, yeah. on the uh, Burton game, because I was thinking yeah. about this. I didn't think, actually, before the game that we could go down, and then somebody sent me something, um, yeah. which was the eventuality that would need to happen for us to go down. And on the social, um, I'm pretty sure it was James Phillips who said he would have rather us get relegated on Monday than on Saturday, which I thought was a bit strange. I feel like, I know it's coming, like we all yeah. know it's going to happen, but I'd much rather it happen away from home. And I, I'm with that, you on that. That crowd reaction. I, I'm 100% with you on that. I'm glad that, I, yeah, I agree. I, I'd much rather have it away from home. I feel like, get, it, get you know, let, let it happen there. Yeah, it's not great for the fans who travel down, but, you know, they're, gonna, they're probably hopefully going to see us put at least a bit of a fight up in that game and, you know, they it is what it is we know it's coming you know there's, there's still five games to go which you know the positive is we haven't been relegated in march as well which you know something that i, I was worried and about also, recently we might not be the obviously because there was a possibility for both us and rotherham to get relegated at the weekend yeah they won which kept their hopes alive but yeah. i'm pretty sure they need to win again well when you hear this podcast it'll be tonight against plymouth who have just sacked the manager so they could well win it but we might not be the first team in the EFL to get relegated. So that's something to hold on to. No, absolutely. It's, it's, yeah, so yeah, they're, they're playing on the Friday night, obviously, Rotherham against Plymouth. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in that one. Um, Up the Plymouth. Yeah. yeah, yeah, indeed. And we aren't the worst team in, in League One history as well. That, that's a real, real positive stake. Thank, thank, thank you, Big John, for saving us from that air. Igmanie as well, so there you go. Um, right, we'll be back shortly. We're going to take a short break. Uh, when we're back, it'll be time for Behind Enemy Lines, but I'll be speaking to Danny from the excellent It's Called Cobblers to Me podcast about this weekend's game. What did we talk about? We talked about how pleased he must be. Oh, they are, really are pleased with how they've done this season and their first season back in League One. Um, the importance of how their lone players have played this season, especially when you look at how badly ours have done, and also their hopes for next season and, and the challenges they're going to face over the summer. So here's the chat I had with Danny after the short break. This is John Mellish, you listen to the Brunton Bugle. So yes, we're into part two of this week's Brunton Bugle and of course, once again, that means it's time for Behind Enemy Lines where we talk to a fan from an opposite podcast, obviously the podcast of the team that we're playing this weekend and that is Northampton Town. So we're speaking to Danny from the It's All Cobblers to Me podcast. How are you doing, Danny? I'm good, thanks. How are you doing? Yeah, we're about to be relegated. So not, not, not the greatest, but you know, we're, <laughs> look, look, we're, 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 we're fine. We're, look, we, we, we've we just literally, we're recording this just after I've done um, uh, Danny's podcast. Um, so we, we've got all the talk about how terrible we are out of the way. So we're going to talk about more confidence <laughs> and the great season they've had now. So should be a little bit more upbeat, hopefully, for you guys. Um, right, uh, before we get started, do you want to tell us a little bit about your pod as well? Just to, so let our fans know, you know, how did it start out and... I think you've been going for quite a few yeah. years now, haven't you? Yeah, it's, I think it's around five-ish years or so now. It was mm. um, sort of just before um, our, our, both of our friends, Keith Curl, took over. Um, we had mm-hmm. Dean Austin in charge at the time. And I think our second podcast was one where Dean Austin got sacked. Um, and then loads of names obviously got thrown away around for the manager's role. And Keith's name came up and we were all kind of like, oh, do we, re- it's, we really don't want that kind of style or that that kind of manager in and he comes um did really well uh, got us up to promote it um in the style that he does um and then just couldn't do it in league one essentially um it it, it, it all kind of fell apart after that and we, we went up in a weird way in, in lockdown um so in a sense we were the podcast was a little bit ahead of lockdown in terms of 
being able to create content so we were in a good position mm-hmm. by the time it came around to to really go for it during lockdown and we got so many old players on and stuff because just basically no one was doing anything in lockdown so we managed to get mm-hmm. hold of a load of old players and just had a lot of fun recording with old players during lockdown so so that was a good time for us um and obviously going up weirdly within an empty Wembley was a strange experience but one we were able to share with a lot of people and be around for a lot of people during that time and when no one was watching anything else and no one had anything else to anything else to do we were kind of there to to chat to people and we got a, a fair few patrons that way and we've built up a community online with with that as well which has been great um it's just become a lot more than a podcast which is really nice it's become a really nice community of people um so yeah and that's been going for for the last sort of five years we do a review show on on the, which comes out Tuesdays and then we do a preview show obviously that you've just been on um, that comes out every week and a, a fair few bits for, for patrons as well so we, it's been yes yeah, something that's built really well and just become this really nice thing that's that's beyond the podcast recordings which has been which has been a great part of it as well that's fantastic Dean Austin's an interesting one two things I think of with Dean Austin is obviously the recent uh, incident with him uh, for Coventry as their head yes. of recruitment I think it is at Watford yeah, yes. which I, the, the thing I love about that the most is the fact that the size of the font on his phone it's, it's amazing really isn't it? <laughs> it's, like, it's probably it's... dad that's probably dad using a phone that isn't it really but the yeah. one I remember is he, he was manager of Farnborough Town in the conference yes. when we went down to the conference I think it was like our third or fourth game in the conference and they were coming up to Brunton Park, and I think he said something like, "Oh, we're going to go up there. We're going to give them a real game." You know, the the, the yeah, for, some of the lines of you know the not fancy dance, but you know they're coming down. They think they're the big boys now, but we're going to show them what it's all about. We beat them seven <laughs> nil, and we we took and we took up we took our foot off the gas in that game as well. And I, which still annoys me because we won't go away from equal in our club record score. So like the fact that we didn't, we just took a foot off the gas late on really infuriated me in that one but but there you yeah. go that's what I remember about Dean Austin anyway yeah, right let's talk about him <laughs> Let, let's let talk about uh, Northampton Town and then and the season who you guys have so we spoke to you I, I think it was I think it was actually you we spoke to back in December and yeah. you seemed pretty happy with how you'd settled into League One well four games to go I'm pretty sure you're guaranteed a place in the division next season based on the fact that teams below you would be playing each other and you look like you're on course for a top half finish how pleased are you with how things have gone back at this level? Yeah, so pleased. Like it's been amazing. There's obviously been a few results and performances that haven't quite been there. Um, frustratingly, there was one in the derby a few weeks ago that we don't want to talk mm. about too much. But there's there's <laughs> been the odd occasional performance that's been well below par. But for the most part, it's been we've been beating the teams that we in theory should be beating, and we've built up enough points to to go into the top half, which is beyond anybody's expectations. Um, considering last time we were relegated fairly easily, um, coming up through the playoffs and not really putting up a massive fight under Keith Cole last time for the most part. Um, so to come up and really for the budget we've got as well, to be punching up in the top half is, is a fantastic achievement for, for all, um, I don't think any of us expected to be sat here this comfortably with a few games to go, um, thinking the last four games are going to be pretty much non-events from our side of things. So, yeah, really, really good, fantastic season. And um, it's, it's going to be another fight again next season because the team's coming up, um, the budgets that they've got compared to what mm. we've got, um, some of our loanies going back, and then there's definitely one that won't be coming back. Um and so, yeah, it, we, we start all over again and, and try to have it, but at the same time, try and enjoy what a good season it's been. Yeah. Do, do you think, going through the heartache of, and I, I'm sorry to remind you, but it's that day, <laughs> the final day of the season, the season before, when Bristol Rovers got that ridiculous result against a, a pretty dreadful Scunthorpe side, which, you know, no surprise that they went straight down through the National League, to be honest. Yeah. Um, do you think that sort of helped you guys to almost spur you on to make sure that you didn't waste your opportunities level when you got up there obviously last season you were you were ruthlessly efficient in terms of like we're going to finish top three this time we're not going to miss out on that and you got that place mm-hmm. and it's almost like this season you've been like right we are going to stay in this division we're not going to you know waste this opportunity now we're up here having been up before as well yeah i think it's absolutely that and then that and the togetherness of the squad that's built over the last couple of seasons as well we've we've kept hold of a lot of players and i think that's been really important to us that the core of the team has been held together really well um so that team that went through that stuff at barrow um with that missed opportunity in the playoffs then going up again 
and doing it again because that's not it's not an easy thing to do to come back from a playoff defeat and to to go for the top three again and to build up seventy odd points again the season after that disappointment. But what the, yeah. what John Brady and the team have managed to do is hold on to a lot of the key players and to to build that journey up with them again. And when we've gone up, it's it's almost become an extension of last season the way we performed this season it's it's the same style it's the roughly the same squad as well there's not been too many additions too many leaving um and we've built that over a good two and a half three seasons where we know what's happening we know how we're going to play we we don't really change our style too much um compared to who we play against maybe we should, should start doing it a little bit more potentially um we saw against derby a couple of, a couple of weeks ago um us change how we compete against the top names in the division. And that seemed to work well. We came out with a 1-0 win, which is a superb result. Um, so that's the sort of thing we'll probably need to work on next season is how we compete with the with the teams with the higher budgets and things like that. Um, but yeah, for the most part, it's 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 been the same squad that's brought us through together, which has been a really big part of it. Well, that, that's an interesting point. It brings me on to my next question, actually. I was going to ask you about the January transfer window because mm. we obviously had a very busy January transfer window for obvious reasons we needed to. Mm-hmm. Yours was remarkably quiet. I was just looking yeah. there before, and was it maybe two players coming in? Was it? I think I'm, I'm trying to look because yeah. transfer marks list like players going back from loans and stuff like that. But it looks like you only brought a couple of players in. And is that yeah. consistency one of the big reasons why you've done so well then? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, for sure. Um, we've had a lot of injuries, but we built a squad in the summer that was basically on top of what we already had, if that makes sense. So there wasn't a lot going on in the summer either. We only brought in sort of four or five players in the summer <clears throat> to add mm. to what we've got. Um, it's that consistency that's, that's carried us through. Even the lone players that came in, Kieran Bowie, Mark Leonard, had been with us the season before. So that was yeah. an extension of, of last season as well. Um, and so in January, it was Tony Springett on loan from Norwich uh, and Louis Molden, the goalkeeper, to cover a, a backup goalkeeper that left us in January as well. Um Signed a couple of players on free transfers since then. Um, Dominic Gape came in, played a couple of games, disappeared. Mm. <laughs> Don't know, really know what, where he's gone. Um, and Liam Moore has been really important to us signing on a free transfer. Um, his experience at the back signing yeah. on a free transfer has been has been superb. It just settled us down for the last few weeks of the season. And hopefully he's one that we can sign up to a deal in the summer because he's looked progressively more and more important to us and having that experience alongside Obviously, John Guthrie's as well has is, is been great. Yeah. What, what would you say your highlight of the season has been so far? I'm, I'm going to guess it's not that Derby Day game either week, probably. No, it's I'm the other one. <laughs> beating Derby, maybe. I'm guessing all. Did you beat them at their place, did you? No, no, we beat them 1-0 at our place. Oh. Um, we got oh, hammered okay. by them 4-0 away from home, but we beat them oh, 1-0 okay. a couple of weeks ago <laughs> at ours. But it, it's got to be the the um, reverse fixture in the Derby against Peterborough. Um, we hadn't beaten them for... We hadn't been in the same league as them, really in more ways than one probably mm. um, for the last 20 odd seasons. And we hadn't beaten them for, for years and years and years, even in the pizza cup, it was just ongoing. Um, we hadn't, we hadn't won in any of the first three games of the season, <clears throat> came to the Peterborough game at home. Obviously everyone's up for it still, despite you know only one point from three games. We were obviously obvious underdogs. And then I don't know if you remember seeing the goal, you, you, but Mitch Pinnock has got it about, 30 40 yards out on the side yes, of the pitch and he's volleyed a shot in the 90th minute in the derby towards the goal the goalkeeper's dropped it just definitely past the line um and everyone's just gone absolutely <laughs> mental um that memory will stick with me for a very long time just because of the way it happened to win a derby in that manner for the type of goal it was for the time of the the goal it was there was still about eight or nine minutes i think of injury time to sit through excruciatingly as well um and even that added to the drama of it that's got that's going to be the highlight of many a season for for a long time it'll take a lot to top that i think yeah um gosh you go back to december when we played us at brunton park what what was your impression of, uh, of us back then? Because, I mean, we were talking about this in your pod. There wasn't actually much between us, I think, back then. No, there wasn't. Like a... Four or five points, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think at that point, there wasn't a, an awful lot between a lot of teams. And I, I thought, Carlo, I thought you were, you were mm. really good on that day. I thought you, you surprised us a little bit by coming back from a goal behind. I thought when we got in front, I thought potentially we could kick on from that. But the way you've come back into that second half, I thought we really stepped off the gas second half. But at the same time, you stepped on it. And Ryan Everson obviously scored his inevitable goal. Um, <laughs> looked like it was going to be the winner. And I think at that point at 2-1, you couldn't really have argued with it if you'd have gone home with three points. I thought you'd dominated that second half. And we just showed a little bit at the end with Kieran Bowie popping up 
important equaliser at the time. And it's these late goals that have been the making of us this season as well. We've, we've scored quite a number of goals past the 90-minute 90, 90 mark. And it was to, to get that. It didn't look a lot on paper at the time. But this kind of result, when, it, when you build up and build up this kind of result over time, yeah. it, it does equal a lot of it and that's one of the reasons why we've ended up in the top half is well, we are at the moment because of these late goals and but I thought and but I thought at, the, at that, that time I thought with the backing you've got as well in the transfer window I, I thought you might be the one that that pulled out of trouble unfortunately not um right let's talk about the danger men in your squad then um I think Barry and Leonard seem the two of the obvious ones towards them and Hoskins as well obviously yeah you know, legendary player for you guys isn't he? but yeah. who are the people we should be watching out for this weekend yeah, it's the same answer for everyone. Mark Leonard is the standout player this season. He will undoubtedly get play over the season. For the last two seasons, we've kind of helped him grow as a player, I think. But him in particular, he's put in the work, he's put in the minutes, he's played pretty much every minute, I think. And he's just got that such quality on the ball. He, he's been pushed up to a number 10 role a little bit more this season and we've seen him flourish no end he creates Mm -hmm. he gets stuck in as well for his for the size he is he'll get really stuck in i think that's something he's added to his game this season the the ability to get to get really in with a mix as well as well as playing some amazing three balls and passes set pieces you know think of think of a brighton midfielder you basically you've got mark leonard um and undoubtedly will be playing in the championship next season for someone i think online from brighton again there's he's he's the one to to really watch and we're just trying to enjoy him for now for the last four or five games. Just, he's just one of the, you just know he's not coming back. You've got to do that sometime. I mean, we we yeah. sort of knew that with Moxon towards the end as well. You know, you know yeah. he's likely to go to another club. You've just got to sort of enjoy watching them for as long as you can. Mm. Um, one former Carl playing your squad, Jack Sowerby. Um, yeah. How's he getting on these days? We were talking about this on your body. He sits a bit deeper now, doesn't he, than he, than he used to do at Carl. Because for us, he played more as an attacking midfielder, really. Yeah, he does. Because I think you mentioned that you were worried that he was going to score a goal, but I, I, we don't really see yeah. that side of him at all getting forward. He, he, he scores the odd no. screamer, um, but yeah, a, a lot of his teammates um, jokingly refer to him as the crab over a, over the summer holidays on the beach. <laughs> they kind of filmed a crab and um, <laughs> was talking to him as if he was Jack Sarby. <laughs> um, but I think that does him a, uh, injustice a little bit. He's one of the key members of the team at the minute because when he's out, you can tell he's out. It's, it's one that you don't really notice too much when he's there, but when he's not, his absence makes a huge yeah. difference to us. It, it means that Leonard has to come back. Um, it means that the gap has to be filled. And when he does play, he's just got that calmness on the ball and he'll intercept things. Mm. He'll make us tick from the back. He'll come out and get it. I mean, he played centre-back against Derby um, because he's just that reading yeah. of the of the game. It was added in. It was a genius move, I think, maybe due to necessity, due to injury, but it worked out to be an amazing twist because he, his reading of the game is phenomenal. Um, one of the players, oh, I have to admit, I wasn't sure he was going to do it in League One, but he stepped up and he yeah. doesn't look out of place at all. I feel like he played a centre-back against us. I don't know if it was this season or last Possibly. season. I'm sure he played at centre-back at some point. He could well have done. Yeah, there was a game... Like I said, he looks so good. If it was near the end of the season, he probably did because he was playing in all sorts of positions to yeah. cover injuries in that time, so more than likely. Yeah. <laughs> crazy, crazy. Well, um, we'll wrap things up in a sec, but I just want to ask you what your hopes are for next season. Now you're know, going to be at this level again. And what's your hopes for John Brady as your manager as well? Because obviously he's done a fantastic job over the last few years. Is he one you may be worried you might struggle to hold on to if he can keep you up again next season and, and does another good job? I mean, I think we're always worried about losing managers when we get to this point. And we, we, when, whenever we start doing well, sort of top end of League Two, and then start doing well in League One, managers players inevitably go. Um, happened with Chris Wilder. Um, Chris Colin Wilder. Calderwood, yeah, <laughs> um, Colin Calderwood left pretty soon after promotion, um, and players just tend to move on from us when we're in this position. So there's always a fear of that. Um, he has got that link to the local area, so that that's the sort of thing that will keep him keep him here and that's probably has kept him here for so long I wouldn't I can imagine he's probably has got mm-hmm. offers um in the past um but because he's obviously he's an, he's an Aussie but his is his most of his career has been spent in the local area of Northamptonshire playing non-league yeah. and managing in non-league and then managing youth team at the Cobblers as well so um th- that kind of connection to the club has grown even stronger since he's been manager so that's probably what's kept him here this long I can imagine him getting a little bit itchy feet maybe at some point just to try and challenge himself um, and you couldn't begrudge him that really um, if a club does come mm. in for him but but we'll have to see about that one it's it, it's definitely always in the back of your mind now though isn't it as, as football fans when you're a, a club that's perceived as punching above their weight in a league you're always going to get that question um, 
but yeah, just hope he's here yeah. as long as he can be. Yeah. Right, should we do predictions then? And I think I know what you're going to go for because you gave an interesting stat out when we did a recording for your pod, didn't you? So go on, give me yeah, that stat. Yeah, I'm hoping it's right because I did a, a little bit of research before and I think we're like two of the three teams in the league that hasn't had a nil-nil draw yet <laughs> all season and now we're coming up against each other. Yeah. It seems inevitable to me that it's going to be nil-nil. I feel like you might come here and try and frustrate us and, and try and catch us on the break um, and we're against that type of team where... If you're in our face, we'll struggle. Um, like Sir Stevenage, we've come up against, completely dominated us because we just didn't know how to play against the team that's come up and and really stood up and fought us. Um, whereas the likes of Derby, we've came to us and tried to play football around us and we've nicked a goal. But I can I can sense in a home game as well against the team that are sort of almost relegated. The atmosphere might not be as big as it has been in the past, and it might get mm-hmm. to the point, sort of second half, where we get frustrated by not breaking through. And I can just see you coming here and just nicking that nil nil. And the way football works sometimes, if if two teams who haven't had a nil nil all season come up against each other, you expect a ding dong. But uh, yeah, I'm going to predict the nil nil just because I think that's sometimes how football comes and, and works. Yeah, it is. It's inevitable, isn't it? That's the way it goes. Um, <laughs> Danny, thanks very much for your time. Really appreciate Always. it. And all the best for the rest of the I mean, I didn't really need to wish you all the best for the rest of the season because you, you guys are up, you're safe, you're fine. Yeah. So, you know, you enjoy enjoy the rest of your season and enjoy your season in League One next year while we're looking up at you from League Two inevitably. But there you Yeah, go. well, I genuinely wish you the best as well um, in terms of getting back up again. It, it, it feels like you've got a good base to come back up on and always a good fan base, always a passionate fan base. So, yeah, wish you all the best in, in coming back up straight away. Cheers, really appreciate that, Danny. Right, we'll take a short break and then we'll be back to look ahead to the Northampton game and, and take a little look ahead as well to the to the midweek game against Cheltenham. Hi, it's uh, Tom Pyatic the second, and you're listening to the Brunton Bugle. And we're back for part three of this week's Brunton Bugle. Big thanks again to Danny from the It's All Cobblers to Me podcast for coming on to talk about uh, his club. Um, yeah, so let's look ahead to it then, um, Adam. Uh, Northampton v Cal United this Saturday. Um, Northampton, fair to say they've taken to life in, in League One a lot better than we have. <laughs> I don't think there's much arguing that's there. That's fair to say about every other promoted team other yeah. than us. Yeah, that's true. But what, what do you think is, is the reason why they've done so well? I mean, the, the thing I've picked out as looking through the things is consistency. in term, Consistency in, in terms of the squad. Not just this season, but over the last three seasons. There's not been a huge amount of change there, has there? It's been sort of almost tinkering around the edges. There's, there's quite a lot of players in that squad who've been there for a number of years, isn't there? Yeah, and that's, having that consistency is a, a bit of a rarity at, at these levels. You know, there's often quite a high turnover of players. Um, but I also think the fact that they weren't in League One too long before they, yeah. um, before they returned and the fact that they were so close to getting promoted... The what would it be two seasons ago now when uh, Bristol Rovers just pipped them to it on the uh, last day of the season for the automatics and mm. then obviously they didn't get through the playoffs either. But having that extra year of being a, a good team at, um, at the League Two level probably standing them in good stead compared to us who probably got up, well definitely got up unexpectedly um, and probably shouldn't have gone up based on the, the talent of the squad and the uh, value of the squad. Um, yeah probably used to them in good stead too. I mean, you look through their squad, there's a lot of good, solid players in there. I mean, Attacking-wise, I think mean, they've got quite a decent amount of talent there. You know, Mitch Pinnock is a pretty good player. Um, Hoskins, we all know, you know, scores goals for fun for them. Um, proper club legend for, for the Cobblers. But, like, I think Kieran Bowery as well, you know, someone they got on loan from Fulham last season who's come back again this season again and has, has done really well. And yet they've got a player like Danny Hill to do, I think, most of our fans a couple of years ago when he went there would have happily taken him to Carlisle, wouldn't they? And he's barely featured for them. <laughs> it's, it's bizarre, isn't it? And how many times have we been on this podcast and said, looked their forward line and gone, their third or fourth choice striker, he'd, he'd walk into our team, wouldn't he? Yeah. It's happened so often. It's so such a, a poor reflection on where we are as a team. Yeah, it, it, it it's infuriating, I think it's fair to say. I mean, yeah, you look at his record, every other club he's been at other than Northampton, he's scored goals and, and uh, Northampton, 24 appearances, zero goals for Hilton. So I think he's just been quite unlucky of injuries, to be fair. I think he's towards the end of his career now. He's 35, so probably to be expected. Um, yeah, um, 
I mean, the thing that stands out for me is when you look at the the January transfer window, they lost one player, went back to Newcastle, their goalkeeper, Max Thompson. I think he had an injury. That's why he didn't um, feature again for them. They brought in a keeper from Wolves, uh, Louis Mold- Molden, uh, on loan for the rest of the season, then brought Tony Sprigger in from Norwich City. And then along with that, Liam Moore and, and Dom- Dominic Gape were signed as defenders unattached. And that's all of the transfer activity. Yeah. Not out. Pretty consistent. It's totally consistent. That's that's the key thing, isn't it? They've they've just worked with the squad they've got and I think some of the signings they made in the summer were pretty good. You know, Manny Monta coming in from, from Walsall, big strong defender. Patrick Buff, you know, showed how good he was at Barrow, done really well for them. Um the one that always stands out for me though is Mark Leonard from Brighton Hove Albion. Oh yeah, I was gonna say we've got to get on to him because that boy is he's good. He's very, yeah. very good. And as as Danny was saying there in the chat he won't be with them next season. He'll be in the championship no. probably on loan or potentially on the fringes of Belt, uh, Brighton's squad, possibly. Yeah. Well, he's... I know there's been a lot of reports that uh, it's Cardiff, Swansea, Plymouth... Um, what other clubs are there? Portsmouth. Hmm. All those clubs are interested in buying him off of Brighton, not just loaning him, actually yeah. you know, paying for him and getting him permanently, which you know shows how good he's been. Um, and especially for a for a team that's not really either or they're not you know it's not quite low enough down where you think he's absolutely carrying them but they're not really that close to the playoffs where you think you know he's up that top level mm. he's still regarded as one of the best young players in the league I think that yeah. really says something about just how good he is yeah Liam Moore was a good signing for them in January as well I think wasn't he, he just he just steadied the ship a little bit at the back for them didn't he and I think he's a player they'd like to keep a lot uh, long term beyond this season yeah probably um but again it's just that you know they're identifying players who they like and works you know for them and they're just sort of plugging the gaps around it they're not having to rebuild um the whole squad every couple of years they're keeping that consistent core like you said and then just adding in the bits that they're missing, which is something that hopefully we'll get to that sort of level where we can yeah. just go into a summer window and not have to worry about getting 10 free agents who have never played for us before and a couple of low knees, you know, just plugging gaps. That's what we yeah, need. Exactly. I mean, I'm just looking at more played nearly 220 times for Reading over a seven-year period. So, you know, he's a, a player who's played at a much higher level mostly, so to get him in and then, you know, sure remember your back line is exactly. It's kind of almost like like the Clint Hill signing we made a few years back, isn't it? You know, a good yeah. big experience defender who can who just knows the game and, and knows what to do. So yeah, really well Huntington for last season for us. Yeah, absolutely. It's also absolutely. a, a good great example comparison for that. Um Jack Sowerby. What what's your memories of him with us? I I, I really liked him. I I was play I would love to sign permanently. Oh, that period. That sort of like one month was it a month period just before a month to six Sheridan. weeks, wasn't it? Yeah just before Sheridan left, where we were absolutely flying with Yates mm. and Nadison and Sowerby. And there's probably other names that I'm forgetting from that squad that were that were very good. That was that was proper. That was really good, wasn't it? I just remember that goal he scored against Oldham where he did that ridiculous turn on the end of the box and then just smashed it into the bottom corner. I think it was. It was just an unbelievable finish. Was that the 6-0? No, but that was the away... Something? I think it was the away game at, um, at right. Oldham, if I remember, because I think we, we played them in the... The reverse fiction on Boxing Up. I think we played early in the season against them um, as well. Um, yeah, brilliant goal that was. And he's got a great goal against Morecambe as well, didn't he? I think with a sort of long range effort. Um, I'm going to have to go back and watch them on YouTube after this to make try and make myself happy after this season. Um, yeah, so Sam Hoskins, as we mentioned there, you're still scoring goals for me. You know, having a long serving player like that does help as well. Um, their manager, John Brady, has done a great job, hasn't he? And I did mention it to, to Danny. I do wonder if he's someone who other clubs might start looking at, you know, someone who can actually build a squad and, and build a team, really. Yeah, and as has been the case with them, that consistency, you know, there's not probably too many managers in and around this level who have been there since early 2021. You know, we maybe I think Simpson's probably, you know, up there in terms of longer mm. serving or at least not too low down. And, you know, he joined a year after that. So... It's the theme of their club that they have. They find what's working for them, and yeah. they've, they're sticking with it. And it's got them to this level comfortably. And it's now a question of how much can they actually push on. 
how much do they want yeah. to potentially risk going for it and it going wrong or would they rather just maintain this level for a bit yeah. and then slowly start to push on that that is the challenge for them next season isn't it? do they do they try and stick with similar or do they try and expand a bit and try and find a way to get results against the bigger teams and push themselves a little bit up the table because finishing that mid table sort of position it, 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 it tempts you doesn't it you think oh you know what we weren't that far off the playoffs maybe one or two signings in here could push us up and sometimes that can upset the balance of your squad can't it well you know what question it poses it's the could we could we, you yeah. know could we obviously yeah. they won't but could we yeah that, that's that is that, that is the big question isn't it and you, 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 it's, that, it's, that, it's that it's that hope it's that yeah it's potential that kills you, isn't it that, more that's than insane. kills you yeah, exactly. Right, uh, a few more little bits on this one and then we'll do predictions. Uh, Ross Joyce, he's the referee for this one from Cleveland. It's his ninth season as an EFL referee. He's taken charge of 32 games so far this season, handing out 142 yellows and nine red cards. Last season, he handed out 118 yellows and six red cards in 30 games. And the last United game he took charge of was the 2-1 win over Burton Albion last October. I think only Joe Garner was booked for his update, so... He's not overly card happy when it's games involving us, I don't think. Um, I think he also refereed the first leg of the playoff semis against Bradford last season, possibly as well. Um, it's a 49th meeting between the two sides. Uh, United have won 13, 16 have been a draw, and the Cobblers have won at 19. Uh, we've just won one of our last 10 fixtures against them, though, <laughs> which is not, not a great start to throw out there, is yeah. it? Yeah. And our, our last win at Sixfields came in 2015, so nine years ago, yeah. So we could we could do a little bit of lock being on our side for this one. I think it's fair to say. I mean, there's been some abject performances down there in recent years. I mean, the three 0 opening game under Millen. Um, yeah, I remember back, watching that. And my mates, that was yeah. abject. That was that was. I mean, they were a very good team that season. But my, I remember watching that and thinking, "Oh God, we're in for a long ride here, aren't we?" Yeah, yeah absolutely. Right, predictions time. What are you going to go for for this one, Adam? Um, I think this could be a game sort of like Peterborough where we're not really expecting much and we get something. Mm. I don't think we'll win just because I think they're still... They're, they're, you know, they don't have anything to fight for, but they're probably one of those teams that are just sort of going to yeah. consistently play at a level and we're going to have to try and match it. So uh, I'll go for... I'll go for a 1-1 draw with a goal from Dan Butterworth. So I should have said this before you do predictions. I should have actually thrown this stat out there. There's only three teams in League One this season who have not had a nil-nil draw yet. Do you know who two of those teams are? Uh, Northampton and Carlo. Exactly. So would would you be surprised if this game ended in a nil-nil draw? The, the other team I should yes. say is Peter United. So, um, yes, I, I would be very surprised if this ended yeah, in a nil-nil draw I, I, just I, I, because of our defensive record. Exactly, clean sheet-wise. It, it, it would not surprise me in the slightest, would it? Um, I'm going to go for a 1-1 as well in this one. I'm going to go for a 1-1. I'm going to go for a goal from Luke Armstrong, though. I think he's going to get himself back on the score sheet for this one. Oh, would be nice. But nice to see because I think he's I feel, he's I work, feel for him, yeah. He's working so hard and he's just not really getting the reward and then hopefully that will come eventually. But you know, next season I think it's a big one for him and I think if he can get you know off running from the start, he'll be all right. So there you go. Right, uh, let's get Mike and Dan's predictions. Let's do Dan first. Pete Carlisle Claxon. We all know relegations coming, but uh, we'll we'll do we'll do the the typical Carlisle thing and. Uh, Sneak a win on Saturday to uh, prolong the agony. Want to go for two one with Luke Armstrong and John Mellish scoring. There you go. That Dan's been super positive, and uh, that's what we want to hear. Uh, here's Mike's prediction for this one. I'm going to go for a three two win with goals from Armstrong, Mellish, and Kelly. Oh, he's going for a balmy one there, isn't he? That's fair to say. Um, right, let's look ahead to the Cheltenham game. We won't go into it as much depth in this one, I don't think. Um, but, yeah, I mean, Cheltenham. I mean, start of the season, Adam, it looked like they were going to be down and relegated by January, didn't it? They, you know, they were struggling to even mm -hmm. score goals, never mind win games. And then, bang, out of nowhere, Daryl Clark comes in, and what a job he's done to turn them around, hasn't he? Yeah, he's been, he's been fantastic. I know there's only three managers get nominated for the Manager of the Season awards, yeah. but I know they're still in the relegation battle. But from where they were, what, how, was it 
I can't remember how many games it was that they went without scoring in their first, was it 11, 10 or 11? 10 or 11, yeah, I think. They scored against Derby, like didn't they? Which yeah. is, I mean, to get a squad that's performing at such a poor level to the point where they genuinely mm. have a possibility of actually staying up is, yeah, he's been, been brilliant. And especially, you know, combine that with the loss of Alfie May, that was probably inevitable, like they knew that was coming. Yeah. Um, but they've done really well to... Yeah to even give themselves a chance, even if they still go down. Uh, and they, they lost Will Goodwin in January as well to, to Oxford. Of course, too. yeah. So, you know, that's another blow to, you know, lose two big players like that. Uh, you know, the, the money's great for a club like Chelsea, I guess, but still, to be up there and, and potentially fighting to, to avoid it is, you know... But I'm, I'm sort of torn on whether I want them to, to come down with us or not, really, because... I've not been for 20-odd years. So it'd be nice to maybe go again, but also at the same time, it is a bit of a pain to get to. <laughs> so I'm kind of like, well, would they stay up be the worst thing in the world? I don't know. Um, yeah, it, it, it just see what happens. I mean, when you look at their Toronto business, we talk about Northampton being very consistent and all staying the same. Man, they've had a bit of a turnover, haven't they? You know? Yeah, they've had... Low knees, especially. Over. Actually, there's one missing from there. I just realised it before. They had seven low knees at the start of the season and all seven of them got recalled in January. I think one of them got injured very early in the season so he went back a lot sooner. But to get rid of pretty much all the low knees and you know, a lot of them were for Premier League clubs and what Clark has done is he's actually signed quite wisely. Tom Pett coming in, you know, good experienced midfielder, adds a bit in there. Matty Taylor from just down the road at Forest Green, you know, big strong striker. He can make a difference. And Kinsella from Swindon. Um Andy Smith, I think, has proved a quite a good signing for them from Hull City from what I can gather. Um, even like someone like Joe Nussel from Oldham, it's, it's a weird one signing a player on own from a National League club. But you know, sometimes you need to just a player who offers something a little bit different, don't you? And it, it's clearly worked for them when you look at how they've done in the table, really. And yeah, in terms of loan signings, they've they've gone for loan signings from lower levels, and they've seemed to have a better impact, haven't they? I think that could be something. To be fair, that Carlisle look to do next season instead of maybe mm. going for these Premier League ones maybe go for players who are at you know decent level championship sides who aren't maybe quite ready yeah. to make it into the first team but the club still wants to get them experience that's maybe a different avenue that they should should look to pursue because you know th- those teams if they're going to be sending players out on loan to you know EFL clubs as the EFL clubs themselves there's probably an expectation these players are probably going to be pretty good. I know, you know, the likes of Jokel yeah. Anderson maybe proved that wrong. But you look at, conversely, the likes of... Um, oh, I'm trying to think of some examples. Some of the best ones we've had in recent years, yeah. You Jerry Yates and you, and, and you yeah. Jack Salbys and Ashley Addisons, you know. They, they yeah. all came from League One level, you know. And actually, we should be able to get an even better quality of play now. We, we can probably look at some... There'll be some clubs, you know, mid-table-ish in, in League One who are probably looking at players thinking, I need to get them off the wage bill. And we can come and say, well, actually, we can pay a bigger chunk of his wage and he might have to drop down to our level. Sometimes yeah, you find point. that. So there's every chance we could do that. Um, yeah, when you look through the squad, it's a very small and tight squad, isn't it? Uh, Chelsea mm-hmm. squad. I was quite surprised when I looked at it. Not a huge amount of quality in there, but you've got someone like Curtis Davis offers a bit of experience, don't you? And then I mentioned Tom Pett and I see Liam circum has been around the block. Um, I think Will Ferry's one they really rate, isn't he? I think that's one that they really hope to get some big money for this summer as well. Uh, I'm not, possibly. I'm not sure, to be honest. Um, in attack, Taylor is the big experienced player there, isn't he? You know, he's, he's been there, done yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. The rest, it, it, it's slim pickings of qualities now. I know uh, that Mike has like like to mention Aidan Keener a few times, doesn't he? But he, he got his first goal of the season <laughs> the other day against uh, Fleetwood, so he's not had a great campaign for them, has he? But this is that type of team that's not necessarily bursting with quality. You know, you can pick out a few players here and there, yeah. but collectively can perform well and yeah. plays in a way that allows these maybe not as good players to get the best yeah. out of themselves is what we should have been. But yeah. unfortunately, no. they've been able to do that to great success under, under Daryl Clark, but it's we've just not been able to achieve that. Even though you look at their squad and for the few times this season you probably look at it and go there's not actually too many players that really stand out and you go oh we'd like to have them yeah 
no, absolutely. I think someone like Tom Pett, that's an experienced midfielder, wouldn't have been a bad one to have in there for us, maybe. But, you know, we got Josh Fell in and just unlucky that he got injured, really, hasn't he? Yeah. It's just, just the way it works sometimes. Um, right, uh, in terms of this one, the referee is uh, David Rock from Hertfordshire. It's his fifth season as an EFL referee, having started in, uh, well, it's not 2013, it'll be 20, 2018, 2019, anyway. Started around about then. Uh, He's taken charge of 34 games so far this season, handing out 126 yellow cards and nine red cards. Wow. Uh, last season, he handed out 118 yellows and eight red cards in 32 games. The last United game he took charge of was the 2-2 draw at Newport County in October 2021. But this was one of um, Chris Beach's last games in charge, wasn't it, I think, if I remember rightly? Uh, A couple of weeks later, he would have gone. Yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah, around that uh, sort of time. Newport had two players sent off in this game and we still didn't manage to win it. I just remember about that because we got back... To, I think we equalised from the spot after one of the red cards. It was Zach Clough scored one of his two goals for us. Um, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I remember yeah. this game's coming back to me now. Yeah, that was a that was a hard watch. Yeah, we, we really should have got all three points but we just sort of laboured to it in the end. But there you go. Head-to-head record, uh, 30-second meeting between the two sides. Uh, United have won 10, 9 have been a draw, and the Robins have won 12. Not one of our last five meetings with the Robins. This is a recurring feature, isn't it, really? Um, of those five, four games have uh, ended in defeat. The last win at Wadden Road was in August 2018. Richie Bennett scored the winner in a 1-0 victory. That's God. Bit, isn't it? There you go. That's, that's... How times have changed. Indeed. Scor- scoring for fun for Southport these days, though, isn't he? So there you go. Um, mm. Right. Uh, should we talk about United then before we do the predictions for this one? What 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 are we thinking? What I mean, it's hard to judge because there's a question over whether Jordan Gibson will be involved. I think we can all accept that. That you know we'll have to wait and see what happens. Simmer doesn't want to give anything away on that. Um, yeah, the rest of it, obviously, Ky- Ky- Coyote back training this week. That was an encouraging thing, finally. But he won't he yeah. won't feature in this one. He might feature against Cheltenham, but he's looking unlikely. <sighs> What, what, what do you do? you make any changes to the team for this? Well, I think there's going to be just because of what's been going on. Um, not necessarily because of there might be a couple because of you know maybe just freshness or wanting to give other people an opportunity, yeah. like you mentioned. Jack Ellis earlier might get a uh, might Pretty get rotated games, because yeah. we have options in in those areas. Yeah. Um, but there's we're at another point in this season where we don't have too many options to call on, yeah. even though we've had to, you know, we've got a squad that's literally full to the brim to the point that Corey Whelan was taken off the squad list. So, yeah, um, yeah I'm just trying, I'm trying to think of players who could maybe come in for, instead of Gibson, you'd hope that McGeoch is going to be, I can't, well, I, I, can't, I don't think won't, I've seen won't. He won't feature till the end of the season, though. It looks like he's, he's basically oh, might, right, okay. he might feature against Derby right. on the final day, and that's the only one. Charlie's obviously out for the season as well, sadly. Right. So I suspect uh, Jaden Harris is probably going to come onto the bench for one of these games. Yes. He, has, he, ha- he has been one of the extra men training on the pitch before the last couple of games. Yeah, I've seen that. There's a question whether Finn Back might come on for Green, possibly, whether he'd mm. maybe put Huntington there. I, don't I, think, I think they'll put Huntington on. I think, you think? I think they've maybe just sort of shut Finn down for the season. Um, yeah. maybe partly on the uh, instructions of, of Forrest mm. um, yeah I just I just I don't know how this midfield's going to look I think Malish will be in it just purely yeah. because we don't have the numbers no. um, not I for suspect, any other reason I suspect you're going to see Neil Mellish and, and Robinson probably be three midfielders again and it's just a question who plays in the wide positions <laughs> up front yeah yeah because yeah, they could obviously Robinson did play a little bit in centre mid um yeah. Earlier in the in the season, um, yeah. I think probably Jack Diamond will come back in just out of necessity, yeah. just because we don't have as many players. But it's gonna yeah. be it's gonna be a weird combination. I mean, yeah. to be fair, against Lincoln, we only actually had one centre mid on the pitch, which was Harrison yeah. Neal, yeah. um, <laughs> and it's probably gonna be the same. Yeah, I, I suspect Georgie Kelly, if he was fit, fully fit, would be starting these games, but he's they're not, not going to risk so. him. They're not, and there's no point risking him. Maybe the last couple of games he might come on and, and you know start those games and then get subbed off later on. But n- no point in pushing him. You know we want him to be fit for the start of next season. That's the key thing with him. And then maybe Coyote might give us an option for the last few games as well off the bench, which is you know something different too. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you that I think that there'll be a couple of changes, but we'll have to wait and see whether Gibson's involved or not. That's the big question. Uh, right, predictions for this one. What are you going to go for? 
I think this is actually a game that we will lose because mm-hmm. that's how Carlo do things. Yeah. We They lift you up and then they put you back down. So I think this will be... I don't think it'll be quite as bad as the reverse fixture in terms of quality, but I think it'll be close to it. So I'll go for a I'll go for a one nil loss. Okay, I'm going to go for a one nil win for this one. I think we'll get a scabby one nil win, and I think the goal will come from Georgie Kelly off the bench. He'll get his first goal for us. Right, let's have Dan on my predictions. Let's go, Dan first. Cheltenham's going to be a tricky game because obviously they've still got a chance of getting out of the uh, bottom four. So I'm going to go for us to get our relegation confirmed in a zinging two-all draw with goals again from Luke Armstrong. And I'm going to go for Georgie Kelly to get his uh, first goal for the club. Oh, there you go. Got Georgie Kelly to score on that one. Um, right, here's Mike's one for the Cheltenham game as well. I'll go for a 2 0 win with a Georgie Kelly brace. We're all fancying Georgie Kelly to score against except you, Adam. So there you go. I'll have to wait and see what happens with that. He'll probably, get, he'll probably pull his calf against uh, Northampton <laughs> now we've said that. So it'll be so slow. Right. Uh, time for the x file section. It's quite a busy one, this one, actually. We've got a lot to cover from the Good Friday and Easter Monday games. Um, starting with Good Friday slash Saturday. So it sort of crosses over into the two of them because the Scottish games, a lot of them were on the Saturday. Um, Zach Clough scored a penalty for Adelaide United in their 4-1 win over Western United in the A-League. Cole Stockton continuing his really good form for Barrow. He scored twice for them as they beat Grimsby Town 3-1 at home. Ofrande Zanzala scored for Newport in their 2-1 loss at Colchester United. Tom Anderson was sent off for Doncaster Rovers as they won 2-0 at Crawley Town. They're flying up the league, Doncaster. I didn't realise. I thought they were struggling against the They did really well. Yeah. I think since February or something like yeah. that, they've got the second most points, but they've played a few games less than MK Dons, who've yeah. maybe two points ahead of them since that time. But yeah, they've yeah. done really well. Yeah, really, really flying. Uh, Mark Ellis, he's scored quite a few goals this season for Charlie, hasn't he? He scored again for them in their 3-0 win at his former club, Darlington. Um, Sean McGinty scored for Air United in their 2-1 win over Airdrie. And James Tavernier, he scored a goal and also missed a penalty uh, for Hibs, so Rangers in their three-one win over Hibs. I'm pretty sure it was. I think he missed the penalty and then scored the rebound. I, I think. I, well, Dan put in the uh, WhatsApp group. He always he always makes a point when it's a miss and a, pe- a goal. He always says whether they're connected or not. He said they were unconnected, so I hmm. presume it wasn't from the rebound. I, I might be wrong on that. I don't know, but Dan Dan you, Dan usually oh. knows this stuff when it comes to Rangers. So I'd imagine he'd be right on that one. I'll uh, have a quick and, look. Joe McKee uh, scored a goal for Peter Head in their 4-1 win over Clyde. There's another point on James Tavernier that we'll come on to in a minute. Um, Easter Monday, midweek games. Naki Wells uh, scored for Bristol City in their 1-0 win at Plymouth. Are you going to confirm that now, Adam? Yes, uh, they were right. It was a unrelated miss and oh, subsequent go. goal. Excellent. Good, good, good to know Dan's still on it. Um, yeah, so Naki Wells scored for Bristol City in their 1-0 winner. Plymouth, Charlie White got his first goal for Rotherham United. I'm sure they're delighted he's got one with a few games to go when they're pretty much down. Uh, he netted in there 2-1. He could have Herman waited, though. He could have, he could have got them relegated first and then got his, yeah. his first nice. goal. So, Charlie, help, help, a, help a club out, why don't you? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Adam Campbell scored for Crawley Town in their 4-0 win at Newport County. Uh, Jack Bridge got a brace. He scored a goal and a penalty uh, for Southern United as they beat Boreham Wood 4-2 at home. Cameron Solkel continued his good form for Darlington, scoring a brace in their 3-1 win at Warrington Town. Stephen Rigg scored for Workington in their 3-2 home loss to Atherton Collieries there. Having a bit of a slump at the end of the season Workington, aren't they? Should know, Jim Atkinson, the goalkeeper, scored in this one for Workington. He went up for a oh, corner really? later on. Eh? Yeah, and then from to make it 3-2. And then there was one more attack from that where Workington nearly made it 3-3, which would have been quite incredible, really. But uh, but there you go. And finally, we sort of, sort of hinted at this earlier. Owen Moxon, he scored his first goal for Portsmouth from their 2-2 draw with Derby County. A brilliant strike, this one, wasn't it? Yeah, top stuff. And he continues his, his ways of producing moments when really needed because yeah. I, mean, I know he didn't score and he scored a penalty at Wembley but he was man the match I think I'm right in saying yeah. and then obviously assist for Barkley's goal in the second leg so yeah it's good to see him it's it's still odd it's still a bit odd seeing him yeah. um, you know 
in a Portsmouth kit, and especially speaking yeah. like to the Portsmouth media. But I'm yeah, I'm happy for him because he's gonna almost certainly be a championship player next season, yeah. and to go from yeah. you know driving vans or, or whatever he was doing a couple of years back to being a championship footballer is is amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Right, uh, on to the other little bits uh, to finish things off. It was the deadline for non-league transfers the other day and there's a few that went through. A couple of Carl United related ones. Sam Fishburne, he's joined York City on loan until the end of the season from Fleetwood Town. I mean, there's a lad who never really lived to that potential before he had. Uh, Nathaniel Knight-Percival, he's joined Tamworth on loan from Kidderminster Harriers until the end of the campaign as well. Uh, here is a blast from a couple of manager related ones and one of them is a real blast from the past we'll do the the obvious one first Andy Welsh has left his role uh, at Geisley AFC uh, as manager um, they've still got a chance of the playoffs Geisley I think so it's a bit of a surprise one to see him leave them um, Emily AFC were crowned Northern, Northern Counties Eastern League Premier Division champions their manager Richard Tracy. Now, here's a name you probably won't remember, Adam, because you'll be too young, as usual. There's one for the bingo, but yeah. you 100% will not remember Richard Tracy. But late late 90s, early noughties striker. I think he was probably better than he was maybe given credit for, but not the greatest player in the world, I think it's fair to say. Came in at a very difficult time when we weren't a very good club, though, to be fair. So, you know, well done to Richard for getting them promoted. And finally... Sort of on. I'll go, go on. on. I'll, I'll go after you. Well, f- finally... Uh, James Tavernier, we mentioned just before, he's become the highest scoring defender for all time in British football with 131 senior goals, overtaking Graham Alexander. So well done to Tav for that. Yeah, yeah. yeah sort of on the uh, odds manager promotion, now relegation theme, yeah. uh, Pascal Chimbonda's Skelmersdale United were relegated from the what league are they in? The Northwest Counties Football League. Uh, would it be at the weekend? Uh, yeah, I can't. Are they in the are they in the Premier Division now? Are they in the First Division? Well, he, he he put a tweet out which which read yesterday we have been relegated from the the it is from the Premier Division. Yeah, the Northwest yeah. Counties Good. Football League Premier Division. I failed at my mission, but I would like to thank all the fans for their support. Yeah, it's, so nice from to Pascal. Unfortunately, to be fair, but nice. To be, to be fair, they, they were they were they were in a mess. I think when he went in, so I don't think it's, well, it's I mean, necessarily the fact that he fault. registered himself as a player because yeah. he got banned. It was sort of spoke to the position they were in as a club. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, well, that's it then. It's a bumper episode. Obviously, with all those games to fit in in terms of previewing and uh, reviewing. But uh, thank you very much for joining me, Adam. Really appreciate that's it. That's alright. Just glad we didn't get to have to talk about the relegation just yet. Put it off yeah, in one we'll be, more we'll be week there soon. We'll be yeah, there soon. Well, we, we thought we'd deliberately do the Cheltenham and Northampton game so that whatever happens, we'll be reviewing relegation probably next week and talking about that. And there will be a post-mortem episode after the season, I'm sure, and we'll, we'll talk about, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, I hate using the word blame, but, you know, who's to blame? What 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 were the issues? What what caused what it? What went kind wrong? Of thing? What went wrong? It's, yeah, probably a, it's probably a nicer way of putting it, but, yeah, yeah it's who's yeah. to blame. Get the pitchforks out. Yeah, exactly. And then we'll look ahead to next season, obviously, as well, in terms of that sort of stuff. But yeah, we'll be back next week to preview the Blackpool game, you know, a game where I think Blackpool still clinging on to the hope of a playoff place, but it's looking a bit tough for them now, I think, isn't it? When you look at it, Lincoln absolutely flying, and they're actually six points off now, Blackpool, with uh, five games to go. I think they, they're going to desperately need to beat us, aren't they, I think, in that game? Yeah. Uh, whatever happens. So so there you go. Um Adam, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you once again to the London Branch for sponsoring the pod. Really appreciate that. Thank you all for listening. That's the most important thing, you know, for you guys, you know, following us throughout the season. It's been a tough season, but we're still we're still just about hanging in there. Just about hanging in there. We'll be, but it'll be confirmed soon, so there you go. Uh, yep, yeah, thanks for joining us. And most importantly of all, up the blues. Up the blues. Up the blues.